Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning. As the Market Risk Advisory Committee designated federal officer, it's my pleasure to call this meeting to order. Before we begin this morning's discussion, I would like to turn to the members of the commission for opening remarks. We'll start with Commissioner Johnson, the sponsor of MRAC, for the welcome and opening remarks. The chairman and Commissioner Goldsmith Romero will, give, will then give brief opening remarks, followed by pre-recorded remarks from Commissioners Mersinger and Pham. Now we will have opening remarks from Commissioner Johnson. Thank you so much, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, we are very we are very excited to welcome you this morning um, to the inaugural uh, MRAC meeting under my sponsorship. It's an honor to be a sponsor of this committee. The work of the MRAC and other CFTC advisory committees is critical to the development of the CFTC's regulations and policies, industry best practices, and standards adopted independently by registrants to ensure internal compliance systems uh, and controls. The work influences uh, um, regulations adopted by other U.S. regulatory agencies, as well as standards implemented by regulators around the world. The MRAC has long served as an effective venue for changing important, or, or sorry, exchanging important and diverse views, engaging thought in thought leadership with experts, relying on discussion and debate to determine recommendations that advance public interest as outlined by the CFTC's core principles, promoting financial stability, preserving market integrity, and enhancing customer protections. Since its inception, the MRAC has served as a critical forum, evaluating emerging developments and technologies, evolving market uh, structure questions and concerns, and endemic systemic risk concerns at the earliest embryonic or fledgling stages, maturing and senior stages of development as well. In formal meetings and less formal discussions, MRAC committee members have previously considered the merits of self-certification in the context of the launch of two Bitcoin futures contracts, climate-related market risk, interest rate benchmark reforms, the market impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic, DCO governance, cybersecurity threats, system safeguards, resiliency, and recovery. In shaping our agenda today, members of the MRAC renewed subcommittees and newly formed subcommittees should anticipate contributing to the creation of solutions to complex questions, issues, and concerns that will define the future of our markets and shape the economy of our nation and many nations around the world. I will formally introduce you to our new chair, the new chair of the MRAC, Alicia Crichton, sitting to my right, shortly. Um, she will lead the dialogue for this morning. I thank Alicia in advance for taking on this responsibility. The committee is indeed fortunate to have her, uh, but before I turn the program over to Alicia, it may be useful to describe today's agenda. Our first panel explores the future of finance. Over the past decade, markets have witnessed remarkable transformative growth and innovation. Earlier this year, the commission hosted a roundtable examining the impact of non-intermediation, a market structure that removes intermediaries that have historically facilitated activities such as clearing and settlement of market transactions. A recent proposal seeking to permit retail market participants to participate in leveraged transactions adopts a form of this model. Parallel to proposed changes in market Market structure, exponential growth in the development of digital assets, specifically cryptocurrencies, creates a related set of questions for our discussion today. Industry participants, public interest, academics, and others will share in describing and exploring this newly emerging class of assets, as well as uh, the uh, as well as indicate sharing indications with the commission regarding next steps. I'm hopeful that the committee and our subcommittees will directly participate in crafting balanced, effective reports, hearings, or proposals that the commission may advance through thoughtful insight and ultimately lead to regulatory clarity regarding market structure and risk management challenges. A recent action uh, undertaken by our Division of Enforcement illustrates novel, the novel legal questions that emerging technologies pose. B0X LLC and its founders created smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain and enabled customers to, exchange, to engage in leveraged retail commodity transactions in digital asset markets. Under the CEA, these sorts of transactions must be conducted on a designated contract market and offered by a futures commission merchant. 
B0X, however, had not registered with the C CFTC. In August 2021, B0X transferred control of its software protocols to a decentralized autonomous organization, or DAO. The founders later explicitly claimed that this transaction to an unincorporated association would render the operations enforcement proof. The CFTC's enforcement division disagreed, and there are many questions here for us to explore, not merely in the context of this individual case, but in the context of many of the use cases that we will explore uh, in the conversation today. Emerging technologies don't neatly fit into either the Commission's traditional areas of responsibility or those of other regulators, like the Securities Exchange Commission. A lack of clarity with respect to the regulatory framework has not gone unnoticed. On September, September 16, 2022, the White House released the first ever comprehensive framework for responsible development of digital assets. At the core of the framework lie six key points, consumer protection, promoting financial stability, counteracting illicit finance, U.S. leadership in, global financial, in the global financial system and economic competitiveness, financial inclusion, and responsible innovation. Similarly, on the Hill, we see action uh, ongoing. Two bills, two bipartisan bills, one in the Senate Banking Committee and one in the Senate Ag Committee are currently under review. Our first panel this morning will explore many of these questions. As we've titled it and the subcommittee, we hope it will lead to creating the future of finance. The second segment of this morning's presentation examines issues explored by the climate risk market, the climate related market risk subcommittee. As a financial regulator with oversight over the derivatives market, we are deeply aware and thoughtful about the growing impact of climate risks for our financial system. The committee took a huge leap forward in this space before I arrived at the commission under the sponsorship of Chair Benham when it published a wide ranging report on climate risk in the US financial system. In June of this year, I supported the publication of the CFTC request for information on climate related financial risks in order to solicit comment from the public, including market participants, regarding the wide, range, the wide ranging set of questions that climate risks pose. Our next segment in today's agenda will be reflections on the successes accomplished by the Interest Rate Benchmark Reform Subcommittee. The MRAC has served as a central hub in the CFTC's work in facilitating the transition from LIBOR and other interbank offered rates uh, that, that had previously been susceptible to manipulation. As we transition to alternative reference rates, the third segment of today's agenda will focus on accomplishments to date and anticipated uh, forthcoming actions. We'll next move to CCP risk and governance, where a number of issues, hot topics I might call them, um, have historically been explored and um, robust debate, we could, we could say, has been had regarding a number of topics, including DCO governance, um, an issue at the heart of a proposal that the commission most recently explored in its first open meeting um, as the commission is currently composed. Finally, the market structure panel this morning will examine a number of issues um, that arise out of um, challenging macroeconomic conditions. Markets have witnessed unprecedented volatility, coupled with extreme trading volumes and at times tight liquidity, placing extraordinary pressure on market infrastructure. We've also witnessed global events, and in fact, geopolitical events, namely the invasion of Ukraine that has encouraged persistent volatility, particularly in interest rate markets and the markets for energy and agricultural commodities. Inflationary pressures and broken supply chains have introduced tremendous challenges for core CFTC constituencies and stakeholders. Coupled with these concerns, the frequency and severity of unprecedented weather, weather events has significantly influenced market conditions. I'll close my opening remarks this morning by just acknowledging and uh, thanking a few folks, if I may. First, I want to thank Chairman Benham, who has been um, uh, an exceptional leader of the, of the commission in his time as acting chair um, and has duly served not just as as a commissioner ahead of his time uh, as chair of the commission, but also during his time in support of the Senate Ag Committee. I'm very grateful to my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, who is here today, Commissioner Mersinger and Commissioner Pham. We uh, crossed the waters together, one could say, um, sharing in the confirmation hearing process. Um, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero and I having almost endured it for um, longer, I guess we could say, than several others. But uh, in the context of, of thinking over the course of the last year, I'm so grateful grateful and touched and moved and um, uh, inspired by the commissioners with whom I'm allowed to serve. Uh, and I'm hopeful that you all will get to know them. Um, and I'm sure you will come to uh, um, be as enthusiastic about their service and in inspired by them as I am. 
I thank the members and panelists who are joining us today in person or virtually here at the CFTC's Washington, D.C. offices. We are fortunate to have a distinguished group of expert presenters, industry representatives, uh, and diverse voices and perspectives, including public interest advocates and academics joining us today. Finally, I want to thank um, Bruce Fekra, who is my chief counsel and the committee's designated federal officer, DFO. Bruce started working in my office in June, and the MRAC has been a priority for him since day one. Just six short weeks ago, Marilee Dallum uh, agreed to serve as an ADFO for the committee, and she and Bruce have worked together demonstrating exceptional professionalism and their tremendous work ethic to deliver today's meeting. Finally, please allow me to thank Lillian Cardona for her service as ADFO for uh, the Interest Rate Benchmark Reform Subcommittee, uh, as well as those in AV and IT who supported the meeting today. I'm also grateful to um, my other senior counsel and interim senior counsel who've supported me since I arrived here at the commission. With that, I will turn it over to my fellow commissioners who are joining us in person, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, or virtually today with their remarks. I look forward to a robust and informative discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And now we will have opening remarks from Chairman Benham. Thanks, Bruce, uh, and good morning and greetings from New York. I know a lot of you came from here, so we were passing ships probably the past couple days, but um, thanks to Commissioner Johnson. Uh, the agenda um, and, and the committee is certainly in good hands, uh, and it's great to see many of you. I know uh, many of you served on the committee while I was sponsor. Uh, for the past several years. So uh, looking forward to today's discussion, looking forward to the, the future work of the MRAC and to see what it can accomplish. As I've said to many of you over uh, a period of years, your commitment, your voluntary service to the agency um, is uh, a great um, service that we benefit from at the CFPC and others within uh, the U.S. government to get your expertise, to get your input uh, so that we can do our job better and think about what's happening in markets, how they're evolving, uh, and how we need to keep pace with um, a changing environment that demands potentially changing policies and regulations. Um, special thanks to Bruce for being DFO, and I do want to especially thank Alicia Crichton for her service. She did um, an amazing job while I was sponsor um, for chairing, co-chairing the subcommittee on CCP governance, uh, and for her to take on this role is certainly no easy task, but one that um, should be recognized. So thank you to Alicia, Commissioner Johnson. Good luck. Well done. You're going to do fantastic. This is an exciting group, an exciting committee, and certainly look forward to the work that you're going to accomplish over the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Goldsmith Romero. Hello, it's so nice to be here today. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Johnson, who has set forth a very ambitious agenda. Uh, and I can tell you, having worked very, very closely with her, it's because she cares a lot. And that is very meaningful. I want to thank Bruce and Marilee for their hard work. And I want to thank you, the committee members, for um, volunteering. Uh, I know you work hard. I know you care a lot about your positions. And we're very, very grateful for that. And many of you I've had the chance to meet with to discuss the issues today. So I thought I would focus today on, on one of my top priorities, which is to find specific ways to promote market resilience. It's a natural priority for me, given that I've spent my entire career in federal service, helping our nation recover from the financial crisis and trying to build a stronger, safer, more resilient financial system. So I thought about this story when the crisis first hit. I can remember all of us were working in the SEC chairman's office at the time. We were in a meeting and we were holding in our hands paper copies of the circuit breakers. And we were discussing and we were looking around the room and I realized that all the papers were shaking. You see, there were no individual stock circuit breakers. So what we were discussing was whether to shut down the entire market a market that was not as resilient as it could be. So much has changed with uh, Dodd-Frank Act improvements and automated risk controls, our markets are far more resilient. But they're still subject to shock and stress events as we've seen through the pandemic, compounded by the uncertainty and stress surrounding Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
So we're now past the point of acknowledging that extreme but plausible events will continue. So it's more important than ever that we prioritize the CFTC's important mission to promote market resilience. Today, I'm going to focus my remarks on two areas of promoting market resilience. The first is promoting market resilience to climate-related risk and then strengthening the resilience of clearinghouses. Make no mistake, climate risk could pose systemic risk to the U.S. financial system. This was the central finding of the subcommittee's report under Chairman Benham's leadership. It's also a belief that I hold. So first, it's important for the CFTC to identify and understand climate risks and how markets are accounting for them. While our markets have long served as a hedging tool related to weather, extreme climate events are now occurring with increasing frequency and intensity impacting critical infrastructure, disrupting supply chains, and stressing agricultural production. So it is imperative for the CFTC to enhance its ability to identify and monitor climate-related risk that impacts our markets and our market participants, including any systemic or subsystemic implications. But second, it is one of my priorities that the CFTC promote market resilience to climate-related risk. How we do that? and the actions that we should take will continue to be a topic on which I am engaged and which will benefit from public input on our request for information, as well as advice from advisory committees. I do believe one way to promote market resilience to climate-related risk is to promote the resilience of exchanges, clearinghouses, and market intermediaries to climate-related risk. So months ago, I asked the NFA to consider climate risk when evaluating registered firms, just as they consider cybersecurity risk. I also spoke with our Division of Clearing and Risk about how they evaluate climate-related risk for clearinghouses. And I'm interested to know how exchanges and swap data repositories are addressing climate-related risks. This is why meetings of advisory committees are so important. Through the sharing of information and expertise, we learn and we gather ideas for action. For action is what climate-related risk requires. Finally, promoting market resilience of clearinghouses is important. I think everyone can agree on that. In July, I voted for the proposed rule to do just that based on this committee's recommendations. Clearinghouses have shown resilience in navigating recent market stress. However, continued uncertainty, high volatility, and volume drives home the need for the commission to enhance its rules to strengthen the resilience of clearinghouses to future risk. While there may be differing opinions and viewpoints in this committee, I would hope there'd be a shared goal of promoting market resilience. When it comes to clearinghouse governance, there will not be one answer. The public interest is best served when the clearinghouses work collaboratively with their members and end users to increase their resilience. Here's my best advice. I do not expect, nor do I desire, the committee to reach unanimous consensus in recommending the specific rule that the commission should consider. It's the hard job of the CFTC commissioners to make those policy choices. Instead, the committee's discussion of the areas where new CFTC rules would be best served would be extremely helpful. And then within each area, a discussion highlighting the diversity of perspectives would be extremely helpful to me. Thank you again to Commissioner Johnson and all of the members, and I very much look forward to the presentations today. Thank you, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero. Now we will hear pre-recorded opening remarks from Commissioners Mersinger and Pham. Good morning, and thank you to Commissioner Johnson for organizing this timely and important meeting of the Market Risk Advisory Committee. With so many significant topics to discuss, I am certain today's meeting will be extremely interesting and I regret not being there to join you all in person today. The markets the CFTC regulate are at a crossroads where existing incumbent technology will intersect 
with the technology of the future. We have the opportunity to decide whether we will make a full stop and turn around, moving far away from the unknown road ahead, or carefully merge onto this new path full of opportunity. But as with everything new and unknown, new risks can and will emerge during the journey. So we must do our best to look ahead and around corners to prepare for and mitigate against those risks. I am confident in our ability to navigate this new terrain, thanks in no small part to the many experts here today serving on the MRAC. Each of the CFTC's five advisory committees provides numerous benefits to the public and to the agency. Government regulation without public stakeholder input is destined to fail. And the MRAC provides a meaningful forum for the commission to learn from experts. Thanks to all of the MRAC members for your knowledge and input and for your support of our mission here at the CFTC. We are grateful for your public service. And again, thank you to Commissioner Johnson for organizing this meeting. And I look forward to learning more from today's discussion. Good morning. It is a pleasure to join you at today's MRAC meeting. I would like to express my appreciation for Commissioner Johnson's sponsorship of the MRAC and the hard work of Bruce Beckrath, the MRAC designated federal officer. I would also like to thank the MRAC members for generously serving and sharing your experience and expertise with us on these important issues. In the past, the MRAC has tackled important issues. These have ranged from clearing, with the CCP Risk and Governance Subcommittee recommendations on CCP governance, to the LIBOR transition with the Interest Rate Benchmark Reform Subcommittee SOFR first recommendation. The MRAC has also recently been exploring climate issues and recommendations. I'm pleased that we have a Market Risk Advisory Committee. As our markets change and we face new and emerging risks, I look forward to your hard work over the coming years and the good work that you will do. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, thank you for your opening remarks. And thank you to Commissioners Mersinger and Pham for their pre-recorded remarks. Before, before starting our discussion, there are just a few logistical items that I've been asked to mention to the committee members. Please make sure your microphone is on when you speak. This meeting is being simultaneously webcast and it is important for your microphone uh, to be on so the webcast audience can hear you. If you would like to be recognized during the discussion, please change the position of your place card so that it's vertically on the table and raise your hand and the chair will uh, recognize you and give you the floor. If you're participating virtually and would like to be recognized during the discussion for a question or comment or need technical assistance, please message me within Zoom chat. I will alert Chairwoman Alicia Crichton that you would like to speak. Please identify yourself before beginning to speak and signal when you're done speaking. Uh, please speak directly into your microphone for optimal audio quality on the webcast. Please unmute your Zoom video before you speak and mute after you speak. Please only turn on your camera when you're engaging in discussion. If you are disconnected from Zoom, please close your browser and enter Zoom again using the link provided for today's meeting. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to do a roll call of the members participating virtually so we have a, your attendance on the record. After I say your name, please indicate that you're present and then mute your line. Robert Allen. Present. James Andrus. Present. Thank you. Tim Cudahy. Present. Lindsey Hopkins. Present. David Horner. Present. Elizabeth Kirby. Present. Derek Kleinbauer. Present. Craig Messenger. Present. Kristen Smith. Present. Kevin Warbach.
I believe Professor Warbuck may be teaching a class. <laughs> <laughs> you might play, right? Anybody who's teaching a class is excused until they're classy. <laughs> <laughs> Steven, Berger. Steven Berger. Present. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Commissioner Johnson will now provide an overview of where MRAC and its subcommittee stand procedurally. She will also provide a procedural roadmap for today and the coming days and weeks. Commissioner Johnson will also formally introduce MRAC's new chairwoman, Alicia Crichton, to the membership. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, this may be one of my the most exciting moments in this meeting for me. Um, first, I like procedure. So <laughs> being assigned anything that has to do with uh, navigating procedure feels exceptionally comfortable, like swimming in water to a fish. Um, the other piece of the puzzle that I, I really wanna highlight here is at the close of my description of the procedural update for our agenda today, I get the pleasure to introduce you to our new MRAC chair, Alicia Crichton. Many of you know her well, um, and as the chair Benham mentioned, you've served alongside her here as members of the MRAC, um, but I am very thankful to her for her willingness to be of service to the CFTC and to the country and to all of you as well. Um, it is a significant leadership role, and as, I, as you'll note uh, when I share a few introductory remarks, she has taken on several. So <laughs> with that, with respect to the procedure for today's meeting, um, Bruce um, accurately describes that there are several orders of business that we will undertake. Um, MRAC currently has two active subcommittees. They are the CCP Risk and Governance Subcommittee and the IRBR or Interest Rate Benchmark Reform Subcommittee. The term for these two subcommittees was fast nearing expiration when I assumed my role at the CFTC. So in early summer, uh, my office moved quickly to renew the CCP and IRBR subcommittees. Uh, we have worked um, diligently and will con continue to work to get these subcommittees up and running again. These committees deserve continuity uh, and our support, specifically with respect to a few matters of business that are before or grow out of the work of each of these subcommittees that, that we'll discuss today, later today. In addition to renewing the term of these two subcommittees, we will renew the membership of each of the subcommittees as well. Um, there is, I believe, and hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn, aspiration uh, to potentially expand membership of one or more of these subcommittees. Um, this means that all prior members of each subcommittee, both those that are on the parent committee and those that are not, will continue their service on each subcommittee should they choose to do so. I'd highlight here that um, there were, uh, and I think we described this at a later point in the procedural notes, a significant number of responses to the call for membership for the MRAC. I think the community knows that something is afoot and there may be a need to get to the table. Uh, what I'd like to assure the many, um, many who submitted um, membership interest uh, to us uh, who we were not able to add to the parent committee is that work streams in the um, subcommittees will take up some significant issues that may have inspired interest in serving on the parent committee. So please um, look, look out for notes from us soon as we um, constitute those subcommittees. We intend today with MRAC's approval to reestablish two MRAC subcommittees whose terms had lapsed prior to my sponsorship of the MRAC. These subcommittees are the Market Structure Subcommittee and the Climate Related Market Risk Subcommittee. Market Structure and Climate Risk, or Climate Related Market Risk are critically important to America's economy. As we've discussed, as our fellow commissioners have discussed here today, uh, the committee's work must continue. We also intend, with the approval of MRAC today, to establish a new subcommittee. This subcommittee, the Future of Finance Subcommittee, will focus on risks attendant to new markets, namely markets for digital assets and markets that are heavily dependent on financial technology innovations. Upon being approved by MRAC, we intend to populate each of these subcommittees with MRAC members and others who are not currently serving as members of the parent committee. Um, so again, I just wanna re-emphasize for those who haven't heard from us that we may already be thinking of a proper place for you. Uh, give us just as many minutes as it takes for this meeting to conclude and for us to gather our energy and forces. And we uh, intend to continue reaching out to those who had offered to serve in a number of ways. 
It was an amazingly rich pool of nominees, and we anticipate tapping into your talent. Don't worry. <laughs> Today's agenda, therefore, is structured around some of the key topics that are top of mind for members of each of the subcommittees that I've mentioned. With that, I want to pause and offer a formal introduction of our new chairwoman, Alicia Crichton. I want to stress to you that I'm thoughtful about the many years of service uh, Alicia has offered in the industry and here at the CFTC specifically uh, as co-chair, uh, most recent, of an, a very important um, MRAC subcommittee. Alicia comes to us uh, with a, an industry background that is rich um, as, and, as she serves in leadership roles at Goldman Sachs. Um, but in addition to and beyond this, she has continued to serve um, in the broader community um, as a member of the FIA board, uh, ultimately becoming vice chair of the FIA board in 2020, and this year, June 2022, becoming the first woman to serve as chair of the FIA board. Uh, she comes to our committee um, representing um, the diverse perspectives of FIA members, um, and we welcome her expertise and experience in markets, as well as her thoughtfulness about the core values and principles that, um, that inspire CFTC regulation. Alicia. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner Johnson, for the opportunity to serve in this role on behalf of the Futures Industry Association. This committee has and will continue to bring value to the commission and to the industry, and we appreciate your leadership in bringing us together. As markets go, we're certainly in unprecedented times, and thus making a forum for addressing market risk all the more relevant and important. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. So I'll transition now to an overview of today's agenda. Today, as Commissioner Johnson indicated, we will engage in discussions involving five topics, the future of finance, climate-related market risk, the transition away from LIBOR, CCP risk and governance, and risks that are outgrowths of specific market structures. As the commissioner also mentioned, establishing a new subcommittee, namely the Future of Finance subcommittee, and reestablishing two inactive subcommittees, the Climate-Related Market Risk and Market Structure subcommittees, will require a vote from the MRAC's membership. After the conclusion of today's discussion or presentation on the topics that are relevant to each of these subcommittees, we as MRAC members will vote on standing the subcommittees up. So now let's turn to the future of finance and risk-related issues that are relevant to innovative and emerging markets. I would like to introduce Jessica Rainier. Jessica is a Managing Director of Digital Finance for the Institute of International Finance and an authoritative voice in the digital finance space. Jessica will kick off the introductory discussion on the future of finance with assistance from Kristen Smith, Jonathan Levin, and Christine Parker. Kristen Smith is the executive director of the Blockchain Association. Jonathan Levin is co-founder and chief strategy officer of Chain Analysis. Christine Parker serves as vice president and deputy general counsel to the US regulatory, uh, sorry, regulatory legal team at Coinbase. Jessica, if you would, kindly please begin the Future of Finance discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm glad to see the MRAC agenda begin today with a discussion of the future of finance at, as it is very much evolving. Uh, we can see this reflected in the decision of global standard setters around the world that have paused work that was in train only last year to shift the intensity of their focus to digital assets and more recently decentralized finance. IF member institutions are today leading development of digital asset capabilities and offerings with live use cases for intraday liquidity, custody, tokenized bond issuance, market platforms, private asset digitization, trade finance applications, and cross-border payment settlements to name a few. Over the last five months or so, we have seen a downturn in digital asset markets. Um, this is following the Terra Luna collapse, which triggered further failures. What we have seen in this instance is in part the natural evolution of, of innovation and, and learnings through that innovation, but also market risks that are not sufficiently understood or accounted for yet. It is the need to understand potential risks associated with changing markets that makes a future of finance subcommittee like the one proposed today even more important to ensure we steward what may have long-term economic value while controlling for risks presented by what does not. 
I would highlight a few principles at this time and then turn to other members for comment. Um, first, where we assess the same risk to exist, we should seek the same regulatory outcome. Not all risks are new, even if the technology makes them look different. I think there's a lot of debate in this area, and these are questions for the MRAC to consider. Um, second, there are no doubt questions regarding investor protection and market structure that arise here. Who are we interfacing with directly, sophisticated investors or the retail consumer? And how does that impact regulation to date? Third, evaluating market risk includes both market integrity and market stability. Um, current trends in the regulatory approach to digital asset risk um, uh, would make it difficult for banks to participate more meaningfully in the development of the sector. Um, preventing systemic risk through containment seems to be part of the regulatory and supervisory thinking. However, we view this as perhaps overly informed by past events rather than thinking about the shape of future development. Hedging and other risk management solutions, consumer protection and onboarding, AML and CFT enforcement, and monitoring are all issues in the digital asset industry that policymakers seek to improve. These issues are also um, all core capabilities of banks. To that end, I would pause here a moment to observe that in pursuing the goal of financial stability, there is a balance to be had that could have implications for market risk down the road if we inadvertently create a, a wedge between financial institutions that are allowed to pursue institutional relationships at scale with other entities in the digital asset space and those that are not. And here again, I'm referring to the banks for whom participation in these markets is effectively punitive to date in many ways. Um, Finally, it is critical that regulation not punish the use of technology. Um, here, I'm referring to distributed ledger technology, um, though this applies to all emerging technologies. While this point is often stated um, that regulation should be technology neutral, some regulatory approaches in draft today would not be consistent with that principle. Um, so with that, I would like to ask some of the other members to provide um, brief comment, first beginning with Kristen Smith from the Block Blockchain Association, um, who would like to comment uh, in particular on decentralized finance. Kristen? Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for including me. I'm, I'm um, proud to be a new member of this committee um, and also want to thank Chair Benham and the other commissioners uh, for for participating today. I, I think forums like this are incredibly important for having dialogue um, and convening um, different types of opinions so that we can work through these issues in a thoughtful manner um, before that, before moving to, um, you know, actually moving forward with regulation. So I think um, just to step back for a second, one of the really amazing things about market economies is that there is this drive to find better ways to do things. And I think within the crypto ecosystem, if you look at decentralized finance protocols or DeFi protocols, um, this is really an effort to find a better way to do well-established financial activities. Um, I think that that Jeff, Jessica pointed out something very important in her remarks, um, and that is that same risks have to have same regulation. I think what's interesting about DeFi, though, is there's a step before that. There's the same services, right? We have people that haven't changed why they seek financial services. They want to generate returns. They want to price and hedge risks. Uh, they want to make payments, et cetera. The, the why hasn't changed. But what has actually changed is the how. And even though it is the same service or business with DeFi, the risks are fundamentally different because the intermediaries may not exist or they exist in a different type of form. So, so we have same service slash business, different risk, and I think that requires different regulation. It doesn't mean we don't want those same principles to be met. Um, we want the same level of consumer protection, but we're going to have to go about it in a different way. And I think when it comes to DeFi, 
this is a this is a technology that it really has only been developed over the past couple of years. Uh, it's largely not retail facing at this stage. Um, it is really, um, for the most part, uh, in the research and development phase. And so, it is our hope um, going forward and through the work of of this committee and potentially the new um, Future of Finance subcommittee, that we can really dive deeper into these questions. Because I think, um, you know, uh, Commissioner Johnson spoke about the enforcement action that the CFTC took last week. Um, you know, from the perspective of the crypto community, there were some things that happened with that, um, um, particularly with holding governance token holders accountable for um, you know, for the entire service of, of that the DeFi protocol was attempting to provide. That to us is very new, and we would love to see more discussion about the appropriate ways, who is on the hook for what liability and what responsibility, um, and are the risks that, you know, may needed to have been taken care of in the traditional approach still appropriate for the DeFi approach. So um, I'm very excited to be a part of this. I think you know, DeFi is um, the next iteration of wanting to find a better way to do financial services. And I think there's a lot of work to do, um, both from the technology side, um, but but certainly from the regulatory side and, and appreciate this discussion today. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, with that, I would like to turn to Jonathan Levin from Chainalysis uh, to, in reference to my earlier mention of market integrity. Thanks so much, uh, Jessica. Uh, thank you, thank you, Commissioner, for inviting me uh, and, and nominating me to, to serve on the committee. It's a real pleasure uh, to be a new member here. Uh, the the issues that that I want to touch on briefly are uh, three three in nature. One is uh, the amount of uh, different currencies that are out there in decentralized finance um, is something that. I think can be overwhelming and, and has been commented on as being one of the key challenges. I think what we see in the current market conditions and the crypto industry in general is that there are sort of reference currencies, reference markets that actually drive sort of overall market trajectory, which I think it should be seen as sort of a very similar way to the way that the CFTC you know, governs over core commodities uh, that serve as references for a broader set of the ecosystem of uh, commodities, and so you know, I think that one of the one of the key things as we think about the future of finance is, you know, can we identify actually some of the the core reference prices that actually drive overall market conditions? And I think the CFTC is in is in a great position to think about uh, that analogy as sort of the driving way of thinking through the complexity of thousands of different assets that are out there. Um, the second thing I wanted to touch on is that, uh, you know, I think as this committee convenes and talks about the future of finance, um, you know, the technology is really evolving. And, and the, the way that I think about market risk in general is that it does sort of end up manifesting as data that is contained on the blockchain. And when you look at the different types of risks that we've observed in cryptocurrency markets, you'll see that you know having a good grasp of both the data that exists on the blockchain, but also the data that exists off the blockchain between market participants, credit, credit lines between market participants and counterparty risks uh, can be essential in actually understanding market integrity and market risk. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, in terms of structuring a regulatory regime, it's very important to lean on the nature of the technology and the transparency and know where to place reporting requirements versus record keeping um, and what, what actually should be done by a, uh, a regulator that has uh, oversight over these markets. Um, and I think that that re results in the ability of the regulator to be a lot, have a lot more visibility into these markets than than previous. Uh, and it's going to be essential as you think about how many different market participants there are in the sort of future of finance. Um, you know, I'll note two two simple things. One is um, the ability to actually take sort of uh, these you know these blockchains and actually produce simulations on 
you know, what will happen if certain events occur on these blockchains. And that's a really sort of useful piece of technology that I think could be considered in, um, you know, the future of this. And, and, and I think the, the decentralized nature of the different market participants can actually lead into, you know, greater market resilience. And I think that that should be something that could be studied by uh, the subcommittee of, you know, where we've seen sort of failure of individual actors and, and a lack of contagion actually um, on sort of the viability of different businesses. Um, the final thing that I'll quickly mention and, uh, and pass it on is that, you know, clearly national security has become a major concern on um, existing commodity markets uh, outside of outside of cryptocurrencies and the intersection of national security and market functioning is something that I think the, the committee more generally, uh, you know, was touched on and, and, and Commissioner Johnson, you touched on it in your remarks. Uh, I think that this is also true for, for the cryptocurrency sector and we've seen sort of actions taken, regulatory actions taken that do influence markets. And I think that, um, you know, one of the interesting things that I think um, you know, we need to be considering is what are the relationships between the national security agencies that protect our national security and, you know, the market regulators? Uh, what is that relationship? How can there be better collaboration? And, and therefore, you know, what ensures the best functioning of markets? And I think that that's something that, you know, um, there, are, there is actually a great role to be played by the CFTC in, in constructing those relationships. And I'm happy to, to share more thoughts. I'll pause back. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we'll now move to Christine Parker from Coinbase, um, speaking from the position of a CFTC regulated exchange. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you, Commissioner Johnson um, and your staff for organizing um, today's meeting. I'm, I'm delighted to participate and look forward to many uh, <clears throat> um, engaging discussions on these topics. As Jessica mentioned, Coinbase operates not quite side by side, but a CFTC regulated exchange along with a spot commodity market exchange for digital assets. And so that's given us a very good view into sort of the differences um, in the regulatory regimes for both exchanges, both marketplaces. Um, I will say, I think it's sort of, it's a common refrain that, you know, the spot marketplace, the spot exchanges are unregulated. That's that's not true. That's why I have a large team of regulatory lawyers to assist me. What, what I will say is that it is consistent that the, re, the requirements imposed on our spot exchange are very inconsistent because they come from the state level. Um, and each state, we have 45 MTL licenses that sort of regulate our spot exchange. Um, and just thinking about unpacking the disclosures that are required, um, they're completely inconsistent. Um, and that's not good for retail customers. And so, you know, we, we are sort of living day by day the, dis, the, the difference between a CFTC regulated exchange and then a, an exchange that is otherwise regulated, but not by a market regulator with experience in the markets. And so sort of stepping back and, and, and sort of approaching this from the 30,000 foot level, you know, one thing that we're obviously very supportive of is the legislation that's advancing in the Senate that would give the CFTC authority over these spot markets, over these, these the, the spot mar market digital assets. And we think that is critically important to sort of import the core principles that regulate our DCM um, and provide those same protections to market participants that are trading on our spot market. So, you know, system safeguards, you know, conflict, managing conflicts of interest. You know, we, we are also in the process of standing up an FCM in a separate legal entity. And so, you know, we're, we're sort of actively managing those conflicts between the DCM and the FCM, but conflicts of interest, record keeping and reporting, disclosures, and particularly the focus that the CFTC and the staff has done around um, contract self-certification and the requirement that contracts not be susceptible to manipulation. I think that is sort of a core um, protection and benefit for retail customers that I think is going to become more critically important as um, you know, the, the, the spot markets grow and more assets move from being just, you know, spot commodities to derivatives. Um, and so that focus on market integrity um, is really critical and the CFTC has a critical role to play here. But one, one point I want to sort of, sort of set, level setting that, you know, I think one question I think for this committee to, to sort of to wrestle with is, 
these core principles, do they work for retail customers? Do they have to evolve or change in any way for retail customers? And it's fantastic that they're principles, so there's flexibility built in. But I think building off of Jonathan's point, you know, again, sort of hopeful that the CNTC, you know, gets authority over these markets and get, you know, can um, better understand the markets and the market participants because not all retail customers are the same. And so it's a relatively new development in the space to have retail market, um, retail market participants, you know, actively trading in derivatives markets and commodities markets. But, you know, you know, I think one thing that's really important to consider in the future of finance is, you know, do the core principles as they're sort of currently constructed and implemented, you know, work for retail customers and what innovations um, or evolution should be made and how those core principles are applied to, um, uh, you know, address the sort of the specific concerns and needs of retail customers. Um, and, and, and again, not all retail customers are the same, but I think, you know, the CTC has the flexibility. So it's something that we should, we should really look at and make sure are we sort of providing the right level of protection for these retail customers. Um, and I think that will be critical um, work for this committee um, as it goes forward. Thank you, Christine. And um, we will have one more brief set of comments from Todd Phillips of the Center for American Progress before turning the session back to the chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for recognizing me. Um, I apologize if my uh, comments are a little out of order. Uh, I did not have the agenda until after close of business last night, so I'm just trying to put everything together. Um, I want to express some concerns about what I'm hearing right now about this particular issue area and what this particular subcommittee uh, could be. I think calling this uh, the finance of the or future of finance is putting the thumb a little too much on the scale of implying that blockchain definitively is the future of finance. And I personally have some concerns that this technology is. Uh, I don't know. It could be. It might not be. But it seems like what we really are talking about here is just blockchain. And I think that we should call this subcommittee something along the lines of just blockchain. Um, I also think that we need that this subcommittee needs to focus on issues that are within the CFTC's specific jurisdiction. Um, Ms. Rainier talked about how we need same risk, same regulation, but there are problems that banks can't participate in these markets. Um, the reason banks can't potentially can't participate in these markets is not a CFTC issue. It's the bank regulators putting restrictions on the institutions. Um, and without representatives from the banking regulators here to discuss, I mean, I see one person from the Federal uh, Reserve Bank of Chicago, but that's you know one person. That's not the Federal Reserve Board. That's not the FDIC or OCC, um, I, I think it is outside the scope of what we are doing here to talk about those particular issues. Um, so what is within the scope of this? Um, I think that we need to focus on derivatives, uh, which are clearly within the scope, uh, the anti-fraud and anti-market manipulation authority that the CFTC has over spot markets and how it can effectively use those authorities. Um, clearly, whether blockchain introduces new risks, whether there are risks with the intersection uh, between uh, CFI and DeFi trading tokens that are on blockchains, but centralized exchanges trade them off blockchain. Uh, I think we need to focus on who is using DeFi. I'm hearing that DeFi is not retail facing, but we are also hearing that there are retail customers using DeFi platforms to speculate. Um, you know, I, I think just we need to focus on what is happening with blockchain. I think it's important to specifically call that out in the name of uh, the subcommittee. And I, I do think this is a very important topic for uh, the MRAC to be looking at. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments, Todd. I will now turn the session back to the chair. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thanks so much. Uh, Jonathan, thanks, Christine. Thanks, Todd. I um, want to just respond really quickly to um, some really thoughtful reflections Todd has shared that um, will be will very much be deeply embedded uh, in the conversation of this subcommittee. So 
um, in a different universe. We might um, spend our day um, exploring possible titles for this subcommittee. My staff and I have already done so. <laughs> and with tremendous effort, our goal was to craft a title that really creates the most runway for a committee to operate consistent with the principles outlined in the charter for the MRAC uh, in examining some issues that may spill over, as we'll talk about today, into several other buckets um, that are um, work streams for existing subcommittees, but that may be complicated to have full focus on during the work streams in those individual subcommittees. So one of the things that I shared in my very lengthy published open remarks that I did not force you all to endure uh, is points of intersection that arise in connection with questions regarding emerging novel technologies such as distributed digital ledger or blockchain technology and um, issues of climate risk of climate related risk in financial markets. Um, specifically in those lengthier remarks, I described the recent merge um, and the shift from proof of work to proof of stake uh, on the Ethereum blockchain and the extent to which that will have um, a po potentially positive impacts on the um, demands for electrical grids um, placed on in certain very specific communities. So I don't, I think Todd, everything that you raise is critical and we are excited about your and many others participation potentially on the subcommittee. Our goal in this point, in this moment is really uh, to um, create the, the runway and the platform for that conversation um, and to offer a space where work streams can begin to develop. Um, as of this moment, we have not um, uh, shaped or formed or taken any particular perspective about how those conversations will proceed, but we concur wholeheartedly that they would be conversations that would reflect deeply on the core principles of the CFTC, on our remit under the CEA, and on the oversight of the markets that Congress has expressly asked us to oversee. So with that, I'll pause and uh, hand the podium or microphone back over to our chair. Great, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, and thank you very much to all of our speakers. So now we'll turn to some more procedural items. Uh, members, we have heard the introductory discussion that is relevant to risks associated with innovative and emerging asset classes and markets. To further discuss these risks and vote on establishing the Future of Finance Subcommittee, is there a motion from the body to recommend to the Commission that it establish the Future of Finance Subcommittee? I, I so move. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have the first motion, and then is there a second? I can second. Great, thank you. It has been moved and properly seconded that the MRAC establish the Future of Finance Subcommittee. Prior to taking a vote on establishing the Future of Finance Subcommittee, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments from the MRAC members. We recognize Biz Chatterjee. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Johnson, and the Chair and the other fellow Commissioners. Um, just, you know, listening to some of the comments and obviously keeping the issue of the name aside, um, I, I think there is obviously continuous innovation in financial markets. And, uh, you know, while, you know, some of the innovation naturally as part of market practices, market dynamics takes hold or dies out, I think we are certainly looking at various issues when it comes to the new growing importance of digital assets, uh, whether it's new types of risks being created, transferred, managed, new market participants being brought into the fold. Um, I think uh, to just you know pick on some of the comments Todd made, you know, blockchain by itself is a technology, whereas you know uh, the financial assets that most people are referring to are mostly around instruments being used for risk transfer, transacting. Um, from our perspective at our firm, we look at blockchain technology not just for risk transfer and trading, but also in providing a lot of operational benefits when it comes to resiliency, transparency, trade reporting. And these are areas and I think which, you know, the regulatory framework is definitely not needed. It's more an issue of, you know, examining some of these underlying core things and from where we stand, some of these 
uh, traded products, these risk transfer products, whether you call them cryptocurrencies or digital currencies, they have gone a long way in proving that the underlying blockchain technology can prove to be resilient in certain cases in enhancing the operational efficiency and bringing a market together of connecting various participants that are transacting sometimes in microseconds and milliseconds. And you know, in some perspective, if you go back 20 years, that's probably the migration that happened in the commodities market from voice trading to electronic trading. So from our perspective, the underlying blockchain itself uh, is, and the distributed ledger technology itself, uh, leaving aside the risk of the assets traded on it, is I think an important uh, consideration for the commission and the subcommittee to evaluate and where it can help deliver on some of the core aspects of the commission's focus on, on transparency, operational resiliency. Ryan. Sure. So I, I, su I support the establishment of the subcommittee to the extent anyone cares. But I, I, I want to look back to how financial regulation has evolved over time. There's not typically paradigm shifts. It's a very incremental approach. And so I want to encourage the folks who, who engage in these discussions to think about it in moves um, on an incremental basis, in an iterative basis. If you go back to commodity options very early in the early 80s, um, technically it's still a pilot program. And commodity options are a huge part of the commodities markets today. And so I, I think an openness to thinking about the evolution of regulation, not on a paradigm shift basis, but an iterative basis, is an important one. And we just want that to be part of the mindset as the subcommittee moves forward. Thank you. Seeing no other comments in the room, I'll check with the members. Oh, I'm sorry, Tyson. Apologies. Hi, good morning. Uh, Tyson Slocum with Public Citizen. First, Commissioner Johnson, thank you so much for your sponsorship and leadership of this committee. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be a participant. Uh, Todd, thank you so much for, um, you know, sort of the questions and statements you raised. Um, from my perspective, I focus more on energy markets and, and energy systems, and I see a practical application of blockchain technology in a number of different instances, and as the gentleman from Citigroup uh, discussed, that there are some operational uses for it. I do think it's important to understand risks from uh, more widespread implementation of this, you know, more decentralized ledger technology, and that's something that uh, I would hope that the subcommittee pursues. On the sort of separate but related issue of digital currencies or cryptocurrencies, um, that I'm, I'm a little less clear on. I, I understand, uh, I think, some of the early theoretical designs for cryptocurrencies. It appears as though there's been some divergence from some of those initial theoretical justifications for what's been going on in cryptocurrency uh, markets as an asset class. So perhaps the the panel or anyone else could just explain in their own words what the purpose of digital currencies or cryptocurrencies are within our economic system. I'm just not entirely sure what their role and purpose are as an asset class. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments in the room? Neil. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, Chair, um, Chairman. Uh, and thanks for having us here. This uh, Neil Constable from Fidelity. I appreciate it. We're new to the committee, so um, we're, we're, we're thrilled to be here. Um, I, I, I guess I just wanted to speak up in favor of, the, of establishing this committee. And I actually, naming is a bit arbitrary, but I, the name itself um, it may, may not be the perfect one, but I do like the, the the, the, the breadth and the runway you suggest, um, because I think, and, and like like um, my, my colleague here from Citigroup points out, many, many of the applications of the blockchain have nothing to do with things that need to be or certainly shouldn't be regulated. Some of them do, um, but but I think it's also um, it, what is. And we had the roundtable here a few months ago around the proposals for changing the futures mar market structure and the clearing arrangements and all that. That's actually doesn't have anything specifically to do with blockchain. 
right? That's how futures are cleared. They happen to be raised by an issue around futures on Bitcoin and Ethereum that our colleagues at FTX have proposed. But it could equally well apply to other parts of the futures market. So my point being that talking about the future of finance, I think, is entirely appropriate because the blockchain has caused a, create, created a discussion and innovation around things that actually aren't necessarily to do with the blockchain. And I think these things will ricochet around uh, the financial the financial industry. Um, and so having a, a subcommittee that actually focuses on all those new innovations as they crop up. Um, and it'll, when we look back in history, it'll look like a straight line. But right now, it's a very it's bouncing back and forth. And I think setting it up this way is, a, is exactly the right, right approach to get all the voices in the room um, on that. So I'll leave it at that. And thanks for having us. Thank you. OK, I think you can. Where? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for your sponsorship of this um, <clears throat> of this forum. I just want to add that you know, as we think through, and I, of course, um, uh, very much in favor of the establishment of the subcommittee. But I want to add too that as we think through this through the context of finance, it also intersects significantly with consumer products and innovation in that space as well, and that we think through issues in the subcommittee with that lens as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to uh, to see if there are any comments from MRAC members that are joining virtually. Okay, I don't think we have any at the moment. Would any of the commissioners like to ask questions before the membership votes? I'll just say really quickly, I know that uh, a number of you have burning comments that you want to share about the scope and nature um, of this particular subcommittee. And there may be members of the public um, tuned in as well who would want to share something. At this point, um, to take a, a note from uh, Tyson's comment, I, I think all questions could be on the table. Um, this is, um, we are starting carte blanche. There really isn't an agenda fixed firm. And I do believe that um, all valuable questions examining, as we were describing the issues within the scope of the remit of the, the MRAC and the CFTC, are questions that we would want to invite exploration of. Um, there's an education here to be had, I think, by many of us. I won't say all, but I will certainly acknowledge that notwithstanding several years of study and thoughtfulness personally engaged in exploring what could be found or discovered or understood about what is happening with respect to the single use case of um, cryptocurrencies or the broader use case of distributed digital ledger and the many use cases that will arise in the application of that technology and many other technologies. To be quite honest, we didn't reference artificial intelligence. We didn't talk at all about technologies that are emerging in the context of artificial intelligence, supervised, unsupervised learning. There are many, I think, issues that really neatly fit within the bucket of this discussion. Uh, it will be um, the, the uh, obligation of the chair of this subcommittee <laughs> to harness uh, a reasonable agenda if the subcommittee is should proceed. Um, but we would welcome, in advance of even populating that subcommittee, some of the comments that you may have had today and were not able to share. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. If there's no further discussion, I'll just take one more look. We will now take a vote on the motion to reestablish the Future of Finance Subcommittee. As a point of order, a simple majority vote of the present MRAC members is necessary for the motion to pass. All those in favor of establishing the Future of Finance Subcommittee say aye. 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 Thank you. All those opposed? Any ab abstentions? Any member opposed that is joining virtually? Any abstentions from the members joining virtually? Okay, thank you. The ayes have it. The motion has passed, and we will submit the necessary paperwork to the commission to establish the future of finance subcommittee, and we will be seeking MRAC and non-MRAC members to serve on the subcommittee. Now we'll turn to the second section of the day to cover matters that are important to mitigating climate-related market risk. Peter Zaman from the Singapore office of HFW will provide an overview of recent significant developments at the intersection of policy, 
regulation, and climate change. Peter is a partner at HFW and a global leader in climate finance and environmental products and markets. I would like to ask Peter to kindly begin the presentation. Um, thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, it is quite a quite a far reach for Singapore to be speaking all the way into Washington, but I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, so my thanks to Commissioner Johnson and, of course, to you, Chair Christen, for inviting me to do this presentation today. I do have a series of slides. Um, there is a lot of ground to cover and how much of it I can get through in the time allotted to me is not something I'm certain about, but I will do my best. And uh, to the extent that I do overstep my, overstay my welcome and I land up speaking about things that you're not interested in, you, can, you, have, my, you have my license to uh, interrupt me and move me on. So can I ask um, the organizers to please put up the slides, please, and then take it to uh, yeah, th this is the agenda of what we're going to cover today. I was asked to talk about the environmental developments in the market, and frankly, there are just so many. It is a question of selecting which ones I wish to talk about and share with you today. And I think recognizing market developments is probably the criteria that we are focusing on today, because the market is a nascent market, and therefore the risk elements are still being created rather than existing at this point. But there are a couple of things worth knowing and knowing and noting, and there are a couple of trends worth observing. And I think hearing what I heard about the earlier segment and particular the focus on distributed leisure technology, well, that has a, a carbon market context as well. And I will I will give you a little bit of insight as to the crossover points where DLT as a technology and carbon markets as an asset class are beginning to have very, very serious engagement and conversation with each other. So with that in mind, could I ask you to move to the next slide, please? I'm gonna kick off by talking about the ICVCM and the VCMI. Now, the Voluntary Carbon Markets Initiative, which is what VCMI is an acronym for, is like the ICVCM, which is the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets, a private sector initiative to become standard setters for voluntary carbon markets. Now, some of you who are familiar with voluntary carbon markets will say, I've heard of VERA and I've heard of Gold Standard and I've heard of ACR and I've heard of CAR. Aren't they standards already? And the answer to that would be, yes, they are very much standards. But ICVCM and VCMI would like to see themselves as the standards for the standards. And, I, and yet they are not regulators. Now, given that they're a private sector initiative to raise the quality of different aspects of the market, it's worth therefore understanding where the difference between VCMI's efforts and ICVCM um, efforts lie. So the ICVCM is focused on supply side issues and VCMI is focused on demand side issues. The context, of course, is voluntary carbon markets where corporates across the world are making net zero commitments. And part of their net zero commitment involves them trying to handle their scope three emissions. So for many, many, many manufacturing uh, companies, a lot of their carbon footprint basically is a scope three carbon footprint and not so much their carbon scope one or scope two carbon footprints. But of course, scope three carbon footprint means that they essentially are part of their supply chain, very likely outside their own jurisdiction and definitely outside their, um, their corporate uh, relationships. And therefore, ultimately, it becomes a question of how much influence they have in reducing or persuading the suppliers to reduce their own carbon footprint. But ultimately, there will be an element of carbon that nonetheless they will take responsibility for if they take on a carbon commitment with scope three uh, included. And when they do, they are looking for carbon offsets with a view to neutralizing the impact of that carbon footprint. So the demand side of the voluntary carbon markets is driven by that principle and that purpose. And then it becomes a question of, well, where do you get these carbon credits from? And part of what ICBCM are trying to do is to say that the quality of the carbon credit could be better across the landscape. 
And in fact, if you look at the different standards, they all take slightly different approaches about how and what type of carbon credits they, uh, they uh, uh, issue or create, and therefore what governance regime applies behind their creation and their process. And essentially what ICDCM has recognized is that we need some kind of standardization of that approach, because without it, we are not gonna have the necessary liquidity in the markets to be able to create a, a strong enough um, market for intermediaries to supply and support the buy side of the market. The buy side of the market, of course, are the end buyers or the corporates who are going to be using these credits by retiring them to offset their scope three emissions. And in doing so, the question really is, is what kind of claims are they making? Are they making net zero claims? Are they making claims to be aligned with SBTI uh, objectives? Are they saying they're carbon neutral? What do these terms mean and who do, who can ensure that these claims are legitimate and don't amount to greenwashing? So that's where the VCMI plays a role. So the, the buy side and, and, uh, and sort of sell side landscape, if you will, is divided between these two organizations and their respective efforts. Next slide, please. So the VCMI has published a, cl a claims code of practice, and therefore the notion is that you get market, market technical experts, form an advisory group, and get them to start telling you what credible carbon claims in respect of using carbon claims towards your net zero commitments look like. There was a consultation paper that they published, uh, and the consultation closed on the 12th of August. Next slide, please. In order to make a claim under the VCMI standard, you have to first be able to meet their prerequisites. And their prerequisites include, if you're a corporate, that you will have made a net zero commitment, and that net zero commitment will include all, ski, all three scopes of emissions, and you will also commit to a series of other things which are all sort of prescribed by the VCMI. And assuming you meet those prerequisites, then you would be very clear about the type of claim you're going to make. And they've categorized claims into gold, silver, and bronze based on the degree of how you are planning to deal with your scope three emissions and what type of carbon offset units you're going to use um, to achieve those claims. And then it's a question of making sure that you're using high quality carbon credits on the question of what is a high quality carbon credit, the VCMI does make a proposal and a recommendation, but they recognize that that is predominantly the domain of what ICVCM are trying to do, and therefore they defer to ICVCM for answering the question of what exactly is a high quality credit, carbon credit. And we'll, we'll look at that when we look at some of the slides associated with the ICVCM. Ultimately, when you do surrender your carbon credits or retire your carbon credits to offset your emissions, there is a recommendation about how you should be reporting transparently the source of your carbon credits, which country they came from, whether or not there's a corresponding adjustment associated with it, et cetera. Next slide, please. Contrasting that with the ICVCM. So the ICVCM has published the core carbon principles. And this is a assessment framework and assessment procedure whereby the existing carbon standards, the VERA, the gold standards, the ACR, are these voluntary standards would submit themselves to assessment by the ICBCM in respect of measuring their existing processes against the core carbon principles. So the, there are 10 core carbon principles against which they would be measured. And if they pass, they would be considered CCP eligible standards. The framework and assessment process is both at the governance level of the standard and subsequent to that at the methodology level for the different carbon offsets that are being um, issued by those standards. But it is not at the individual project level. But what essentially will happen though, is that if you take gold standard as an example, and gold standard become a CCP eligible standard whose certain methodologies have been approved as well by the same CCP assessment process, then any carbon credit issued by that CCP uh, eligible methodology by the gold standard will be tagged as being a CCP eligible carbon credit. 
And the theory is that you use this benchmarking or kite process to be able to give people in the market confidence that the standard itself has been blessed by a secondary standard, an overseer, if you will, and therefore they should take comfort from the um, assessment process that gold standard in my example has gone through. Next slide, please. The 10 core principles upon which a, a standard will be assessed are, as you see on the slides here, additionality, mitigation activity information, the fact that there must be no double counting, the fact that the credits generated must have permanence, they will be uh, assessed on the basis of the program's governance process, they must have a registry to give transparent information, uh, there must be robust independent third party validation and verification, and there must be a robust quantification of emission reductions and removals. Sustainable development uh, impacts and safeguards must be uh, enshrined within the process of the in relevant standard in question. And what they do um, has to be consistent with the transition towards net zero emissions. Next slide, please. So if you get carbon credits, voluntary carbon credits that are issued by a CCP approved um, through, a, that are issued by a standard that has achieved CCP approval, then you get the carbon credit tagged by um, as a CCP eligible one. And then theory is you trade them on the secondary market. The consultation that the ICBCM um, is running ended officially yesterday. Um, they intend to collate feedback from the consultation process and confirm and finalize their methodology and framework accordingly. And off the back of that, they intend to publish early next year um, the outcomes of what they're going to apply and then start assessment of the standards that will submit themselves to the ICVCM for assessment. Next slide, please. Recognizing that there are platforms that today uh, trade carbon offset credits. Um, some of them are spot markets, some of them are futures markets. Um, the OTC or over-the-counter market shouldn't be necessarily ignored. So there has not historically been standard documentation for trading voluntary carbon credits to date. ISDA is in the process of working on some documentation. It's been uh, a, a work in progress for a couple of months now. They're getting to the stage where the documentation that they're going to recommend is going to be published in the next few weeks. One thing that the process um, acknowledged is that the market is continuously evolving and therefore it's very difficult to lock in a standard form contract for trading voluntary carbon credits just yet. And therefore Vera anticipates that there will be multiple iterations of what they're considering, to, considering to, uh, as standard terms for trading voluntary carbon credits. So it's a bit like general terms and conditions that are incorporated into an ISDA trade confirmation, but then will be traded under a standard ISDA master agreement. So there won't be at this point a voluntary carbon annex as you would have for other products traded under the ISDA documentation in the past. The International Emissions Trading Association has um, a equivalent to that uh, document, but it's called a non-contingent secondary emissions purchase agreement. Um, and it's a standalone document in the sense that it's a, a master agreement with the terms built into it. And therefore it's slightly different from the way in which the ISDA, um, will, will, do, ISDA documentation will work. Next slide, please. I thought I would mention um, the ITA Digital Action Task Force and the Digital Carbon uh, Market Code of Practice that is being currently worked on. The driver for this was um, an event that happened involving voluntary carbon credits towards the end of last year, when a uh, DAO took a number of carbon credits, uh, retired them, and then recreated them in the form of, of tokens and essentially sold a lot of carbon, voluntary, retired voluntary carbon credits into um, the tokenized market. And um, the net effect of that is that it, it had a direct impact on existing carbon credits because the price uh, of those carbon credits shot up because there was a bit of artificial scarcity caused by the drainage of a lot of carbon credits into the tokenized world. Now, one of the 
problems, I guess, associated with that process was that when you retire a carbon, voluntary carbon credit, and you therefore make it redundant within the framework of the existing standard that recognizes that particular unit and issue that particular unit, the retirement process essentially ends the environmental benefit associated with that carbon offset. So when you tokenize something that has no environmental benefit in it, then the tokenized product equally has no environmental benefit in it. But there were uh, very few people in the market, including retail customers who probably under, understood this. So the standards had to take action and various warnings were issued about the standard about this kind of behavior by um, market actors who are doing so without necessarily the consent and approval of the relevant standard whose credits were being retired and therefore reissued in the form of a token. So in the International Emissions Trading Association felt that it was relevant for them in their capacity as a trade association to come up with recommendations for a code of best practice so that both the standards in question could start considering what to do about this effort by people to recreate carbon credits in tokenized form versus the notion that maybe the standards themselves should perhaps be issuing their own tokens. And one of the thought processes were that you create some kind of code of practice, come up with standardized language that recognizes the distinction between tokens that are issued by the standards, which they want to call native tokens, or tokens that are issued based on existing carbon units. So in other words, are a derivation or derived from a, a existing issued voluntary carbon unit. And therefore, language around that um, needs to be harmonized and standardized and has to be recognized. So part of the purpose of the code of press practice is to create some kind of common minimum practices associated with people looking to do that. So this code of best practice is still at a very early stage, but it is being developed because of the incidents that have happened in the market in the past. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about the climate warehouse, um, mainly because I thought it was relevant, both in terms of the trajectory of where carbon market infrastructure is going, but as well as I think relevant to what I heard in the earlier session about one of the uses of DLT um, technology. So the climate warehouse is a joint project uh, led by the government of Singapore, the International Emissions Trading Association and the World Bank. And essentially what it does is it recognizes that in the world of the Paris Agreement, there isn't a single overarching um, set of rules that everybody follows. Every country who has a nationally determined contribution can make their own pathway as to how they meet their NDC commitments. And therefore they have different ways in doing things, including the fact that they can create their own carbon registry, but then there isn't necessarily the easiest interconnectivity between these various registries. And then you've got the voluntary market registries run by the VERAs and the gold standards of this world who are not interconnected with each other. So the notion of the climate warehouse is in fact to create a connecting uh, infrastructure whereby existing registries who are not necessarily connected with other registries can nonetheless share the data on their registry into a common central data repository. And the Climate Warehouse essentially is designed to be such a climate uh, a data repository for carbon-related information. And the idea is that by making this information transparent, you achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement by increasing environmental integrity and helping carbon markets therefore connect with each other. And by doing so, you um, reduce double counting and improve compliance reporting. The underlying choice of technology being used to build this infrastructure is the distributed ledger technology. And it is a distributed ledger technology that is run through what's called the proof of stake approach. And again, the World Bank went through a process in identifying which service provider should be used so that you um, that achieve the least amount of environmental impact, despite the, the criticisms that historically have existed for distributed ledger technology. Uh, the process of now in setting up the climate warehouse is underway. 
Uh, and one would hope that by the time we get to COP27 um, in Egypt, there will be further announcements about the progress on the climate warehouse. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about the Ethereum merge, but I think a lot of people who are in the room probably already know about it. The main thing I wanted to highlight about the Ethereum merge is that it was predominantly designed around reducing the energy consumption in the blockchain context. For those of you who are very familiar with the blockchain technology, you will know that Bitcoin and other use cases for the blockchain followed what's called a proof of work approach, which was highly energy uh, intensive and therefore ultimately from a um, carbon emissions footprint perspective, quite unsustainable. So the exercise by Ethereum to redefine all of its infrastructure so that it moves away from a proof of work model to a proof of state model did, or is it's alleged, has reduced the energy intensive aspects of how um, distributed leisure markets worked. One of the trade-offs for proof of work versus proof of stake arguably is that proof of stake is a little less secure than proof of work, but nonetheless, the market is confident that proof of stake is a highly efficient way of, um, and highly secure way of managing uh, digital information on the blockchain. Uh, next slide, please. Article six is the only element of the Paris Agreement uh, negotiations that I wanted to highlight here because it's the one that was agreed um, in Glasgow uh, when the COP last met. The next COP in Egypt is important because the Article six mechanism is essentially the Paris Agreement climate markets mechanism. And there are two bodies under Article six or two types of uh, climate markets that you can create. The bilateral or multilateral intergovernmental market, which is cooperative approaches under Article 6.2 of the Paris Agreement, or you could use um, the 6.4 mechanism, which is similar to the CDM mechanism under Article 12 of the Kyoto Protocol. And that's a more centralized market infrastructure run and operated by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and in particular, their secretariat. So the Article 6.4 mechanism needs to become operational for international carbon market transactions to happen, not in the voluntary market space, but in the Paris Agreement market space. So in other words, the country compliance market space, if you will, in respect of those countries who want to use the Article 6 mechanisms to be able to trade between themselves in order to be able to meet their NDC ob objectives. So getting the Article 6 mechanism operational is important because although most of the Paris Agreement rulebook was agreed and all the way back in 2018 and 2019, we wasted three years trying to get Article 6 agreed, which we finally did in COP26, but now the, the rubber has to, has to hit the road and we have to get this mechanism up and, up and running and operational. So there's been two meetings of the working groups to try and get them to agree in procedures and modalities in the lead up to COP27 so that when the parties or the countries meet, they can adopt and endorse and accept the recommendations and procedures from these working groups to try and make the Article 6.4 mechanism um, operational. But unfortunately, it's not going as smoothly as it could be, and therefore we have probably not that much expectations of what might get agreed at Sharm el Sheikh in. Um, in, in end of October, early November, when the COP27 meets. Next slide, please. The last but not least point I wanted to bring up is what I call nationalization risk. So every country who has a NDC target essentially needs to know how they're going to meet their NDC, which means that they must have control over their greenhouse gas abatement opportunity so that they can ensure that it is consistently managed in a way so that NDC obligations under the Paris Agreement can be achieved. Historically, many, many, many countries have had very negligible, if any, legislation dealing with their own carbon GHG processes. For example, they did not regulate carbon as an asset class, and they did not regulate, therefore, the abatement of carbon as an exercise. 
So nationalization risk is the term I use to describe countries waking up to the realization that if they don't pass legislation to control who can carry out achievements of carbon abatement, when they should do it, in what sector they should do it, and how they should do it, then there is a risk that all you get is a free for all. And therefore, the voluntary market simply goes in, carries out abatement at will using private sector participants, ignoring the country, and then exports those carbon credits in the form of voluntary credits. And the countries therefore are left worried about now whether or not they can still meet their NDC targets, because it may be the case that then the credits being used at the voluntary level are double counted in respect of the carbon credits that they would otherwise be relying on or the reductions they would be relying on to demonstrate they've met their NDC. So nationalization risk is what the phrase I use to explain countries basically taking command over the carbon abatement opportunity in their jurisdiction. And we've seen a number of countries like Indonesia, in India, uh, Malaysia, in this part of the world, take early steps towards passing regulations to begin that process. Um, I think that was my last slide, and I'm very happy to take any questions if there are any. Great. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and we really appreciate you joining us at such a late hour. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So members, we have heard Peter's presentation on significant and recent climate-related developments. To begin a discussion on climate-related market risk and vote on reestablishing the climate-related market risk subcommittee, which is currently inactive, is there a motion from the body to recommend to the commission that it reestablish a climate-related market risk subcommittee? It's moved. Thank I you. So move. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Great. Thank you. It has been moved and properly seconded that the MRAC reestablish the climate-related market risk subcommittee. Prior to taking a vote on reestablishing the climate-related market risk subcommittee, I'd like to open the floor to questions and comments from MRAC members. Todd? Great, thank you. Uh, I was very pleased to see this on the agenda. I think climate-related uh, risk in the financial system is, is very important, something that regulators need to address. Um, I had two uh, comments. Um, the first, I know that there are climate-related uh, risks within the derivative sector beyond voluntary carbon markets, and I do hope that this subcommittee will address those. For example, central counterparties face climate-related financial risks uh, via uh, counterparty risk. Um, so that's one. The second, um, I also wanted to thank the CFTC for the RFI they issued uh, earlier this year. Um, and uh, it's closing next week, I think. Uh, and I just wanted to say I really hope that the, the commission doesn't wait to act on that until this subcommittee is up and running. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others in the room who'd like to comment? Are there any members who are joining virtually that would like to comment? Would any of the commissioners like to ask questions before the membership votes? If I can just uh, make um, a request for the subcommittee to consider um, this issue of standards and what the CFTC should do with standards is something I've been spending a lot of time on in the last six months. And when I first started, a number of groups would come into my office and say, we would like you to set standards. <laughs> and I would say, you want us to set standards or you want us to adopt standards? I'm not so sure that the commission is the right body to be setting the standards. And here I've been following with great interest the, the proposed standards that are out there that I do think would lend some credibility to the market that would allow it to scale up. So a question I have uh, in my mind is, should the CFTC be adopting those standards in some way or adopting at least some of the concepts that are in those standards, things like third party independent verification. You know, that is just one example or the use of registries or some other um, 
place where you can go and ensure that there is no double counting and um, the the credit has not been retired. So anyway, here's my here's just my request as as we look at how the CFTC can facilitate these markets in the way that it normally does as a market regulator and we can set some standards just putting it out there for discussion at a later date about whether the um, or today about whether the the commission should be either adopting sort of the international standards that are being proposed or adopting the concepts that are in that in in some sort of way and I don't know if this sort of goes to the idea of how we look at our core principles in sort of the way that Christine was saying related to digital assets, but would apply here too, or if it's something more than that. And so I'll just throw that out for discussion but to tell you that I'm very interested in any and all ideas on that. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, for being here. We really are fortunate to have you uh, joining this conversation. And I just highlight um, that we are uh, eagerly awaiting uh, your leadership and sponsorship of the TAC Advisory Committee, which we know is forthcoming. And we anticipate that many in this room and many in our community are um, excited to support you as you launch um, that advisory committee. Thank you for your thoughtfulness on this particular set of issues. Um, I have firsthand witnessed in, in conversations that we have participated in together with um, leaders um, of other federal regulatory, regulatory agencies uh, and in other countries that Commissioner Goldsmith Smith Romero is speaking true and from her heart as she describes her commitment and interest um, with respect to these issues. I think it really highlights two things, uh, her comments and uh, some of our thoughtfulness, uh, that there has to be a whole of government approach, um, hearkening back to one of Christine's other thoughtful points about the lack of uniform regulation in some context uh, and the problems that emerge, how regulatory gaps can create opportunities for arbitrage and misconduct that really is harmful to market participants who are actually seeking to do um, interesting and appropriate work and uh, offer uh, valuable services to uh, market participants and customers in our market. Um, the other piece I'd say is the collaboration internationally. And I've been part of that already and feel very fortunate that Commissioner Goldsmith Romero and I were able to go to London, spend time with folks at the Bank of England, the FCA, um, and participate in conversations that I think are already sort of bridge building. Um, but I'm excited to hear more as her advisory committee kicks off. Um, and I think we'll learn a great deal in due course from her committee as well as the subcommittee. I want to put in a plea probably for a short break. <laughs> Once we wrap this discussion and vote on uh, the climate risk related um, subcommittee, uh, and uh, I will leave that to the chair, uh, but I suspect she might be open to it as well. Uh, just ahead of turning to Anne and her presentation for uh, the interest rate benchmark reform subcommittee. So just wanted to throw that in there, Chair. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll wrap up the vote quickly, and then I think that would be great to have a short break. Um, so thank you, commissioners, for your comments and questions. If there is no further discussion, taking one last look around the room, we'll take a vote on the motion to reestablish the climate-related market structure subcommittee. Same rules will apply as the last vote. Uh, a simple majority vote of the present MRAC members is necessary for the motion to pass. So all those in favor of reestablishing the climate-related market risk subcommittee, say aye. Aye. Great. Aye. All, those, all those opposed? Any abstentions? Excellent. Any member opposed that is joining virtually? Any abstentions from members joining virtually? Okay, great, the ayes have it. The motion is passed. We will submit the necessary paperwork to the commission to reestablish the climate-related market risk subcommittee and we'll be seeking MRAC and non-MRAC members to serve on the subcommittee. Uh, with that, we will pause for a three, five minute break uh, and we'll see you back shortly where we'll transition to live work. Or away from library. <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. I don't know if anybody's made it better. Uh, call the meeting back to order. All right. Great. Now we will turn to the transition away from library. <laughs>
We'll hear from Ann Battle of ISDA, who will provide an update on the transition. Ann is Senior Counsel, Market Transitions, and Head of Benchmark Reform at ISDA. Ann represents ISDA on the Alternative Reference Rates Committee. And although we will open the floor to discussion, a vote will not follow this presentation because the IRBR subcommittee's term was extended before its expiration. And now I'll ask Ann to kindly take over the floor. Thanks, Alicia, and uh, thank you very much to Commissioner Johnson um, and the CFTC staff for organizing this meeting. I'm looking forward to discussing all of the issues on the table today, including um, to continue what will be the last few months of discussing the transition away from LIBOR. Um, I do have a few slides, but I'm going to keep this quite short. Um, I think it makes sense to continue the committee, uh, certainly through the middle of next year when we will finally say farewell to U.S. dollar LIBOR. However, when thinking about what to highlight today, I think the good news is from a derivatives market perspective, I don't have too many exciting or anything surprising to share with you. Um, I did think it uh, made sense to go through some of the latest data we have for the um, adoption of SOFR, which I think we all know is the identified alternative to U.S. dollar LIBOR. Um, ISDA, together with Claris, publishes um, an indicator for SOFR, as well as five other risk-free rates on a monthly basis. It continues to grow, and SOFR in particular has been making um, significant leaps on a month-to-month -month basis. It's now well over 50% of the U.S. dollar exposure, and um, the exposure on the denominator for that indicator is um, clear derivatives, so both OTC and exchange-traded clear derivatives globally. If you go back and look at this historically to give a nod to the subcommittee of this committee, which was led by Tom Whip, who couldn't be here today, um, the biggest jump we saw in that really was in connection with um, the CFTC MRAC SOFR first initiative last year. That and then at the end of last year, the supervisory prohibition on no new U.S. dollar LIBOR. So ISDA will continue to publish this data, and I expect we will continue to see um, growth in the SOFR derivatives markets. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this lays out um, really the landscape of um, ISDA protocols, ISDA definitions, legislation and potential legislation that will deal with the U.S. dollar LIBOR exposure that existed prior to the move to SOFR and new transactions and that will still exist at the middle of next year. I think the good news is there is that a significant majority of that exposure has robust fallbacks um, and specifically has SOFR-based fallbacks for U.S. Um, dollar um, or, or U.S. dollar LIBOR exposure under U.S. law contracts. The recent federal legislation took care of um, anything that hadn't been amended. Um, and the Fed recently proposed regulation under the LIBOR Act, which would result in any um, derivatives that um, do not have the fallbacks in ISDA documentation and have not otherwise been amended to include fallbacks to a specific rate to fall back to the SOFR-based fallback rate um, under the ISDA protocol. And they cited um, their views that consistency was important in the derivatives market as their reason for that proposal. So that regulation hasn't been finalized, but I think we expect it in the near term. I think the last piece of the puzzle, perhaps, for legacy U.S. dollar LIBOR derivatives is whether for non-U.S. law contracts, the FCA and the U.K. will compel IBA to publish a synthetic U.S. dollar LIBOR. Um, that would only be for legacy transactions. It would not be permitted for new transactions. And the FCA recently um, consulted on that. The last thing I'll mention on this slide is um, when, when thinking about what the market still needs to do and the derivatives market specifically, um, certain derivatives, um, constant maturity swaps or CMS, reference a swap rate 
that based on US dollar LIBOR as opposed to US dollar LIBOR itself, that swap rate is also used for the settlement of swaptions. And so different fallbacks are required for those transactions. ISDA has published um, documentation and a protocol to agree to those fallbacks. But I do think that is one um, additional step that the market needs to take. The ARC has made some recommendations on that point. We don't think it's a risk that market participants won't take that step, but I think it's just a good reminder that we've made enormous strides, we're in the right place, but um, there is still work to do um, at a firm level between now and the middle of next year. Go to the next slide. Again, I also won't uh, spend a lot of time on this. This shows um, the number of counterparties and um, geographic breakdown for those who have adhered to the is the fallback protocol with the fallbacks for derivatives referencing US dollar LIBOR. Um, the map is as of much earlier this year, but uh, the numbers haven't changed significantly. Not surprising. It is still possible to adhere to that protocol. We saw, um, you know, the bulk of the adherence was when we first published it about two years ago. We saw a jump at the end of last year when the non-US dollar LIBOR um, uh, settings ceased, and I expect we may see another jump in the middle of next year. Yesterday, there were 15,364 adherents, which does make it, I think, our highest adhere to protocol other than those that were specifically um, required by regulation. Go to the next slide. So this slide I also want to spend a lot of time on, but we hear a lot about SOFR, the identified alternative and different forms of SOFR. If you take a look at the um, meeting readouts and prior meeting minutes from the ARC, I think the use of term SOFR versus SOFR is um, an issue that continues to show up in those readouts and continues to be discussed. The ARC has published best practices and is reviewing those. But here, I just wanted to um, break down the differences uh, without any view on um, where those should be used, because I think the ARC is taking the lead on that, um, at least um, in the United States. Um, I will point out that all these forms of SOFR are available in the ISDA definitions for derivatives. So to the extent a market participant is looking to move to SOFR and decides what form is appropriate, they have the building blocks to do so in the derivatives market. Of course, in the top row, SOFR, as published by the New York Fed, which is used in OIS, compounded in arrears, and which is um, the building block for the US dollar LIBOR fallbacks in ISDA documentation published by Bloomberg, is I think the rate that is um, in the vast majority of the derivatives market. However, um, I think the term SOFR has been critical um, uh, and necessary to the transition away from U.S. dollar LIBOR in certain cash markets, including the loan markets. I think hedging of those SOFR-based products is critical. And um, I think aside from whether there will be um, synthetic LIBOR is um, the topic that's receiving the most, uh, most discussion uh, today in the lead up to the middle of next year. So with that, I think I would open it up to questions and, um, you know, on behalf of Tom Whip and the leadership for the interest rate subcommittee, um, any questions or suggestions for what uh, that subcommittee may want to do in the coming months. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Anne. And to Anne's last point, we'll open it up to the MRAC members for comments and questions. Are there any virtual members who have comments or questions? Okay, and then I'll turn to the commissioners to see if you have any feedback. I just have one thing to share. Um, first, thanks, Anne, so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, tons of information contained therein. I can imagine that a handful of um, new members uh, recently joining this committee, their heads may be spinning as they're attempting to navigate the waters of the acronyms and the transition. Um, and I say that uh, largely because 
it, it really is a case that we're expanding the diversity of voices around the table. And so there really is a need increasingly for us to have these conversations, even if they feel like review for those of us who've long been in the room. I also just want to um, thank uh, Lillian Cardona, who's in the back of the room joining us, who's the ADFO for the Interest Rate Benchmark Reform um, Subcommittee. And I wanted to acknowledge Alicia Lewis, who had been here, she may have stepped out, uh, who previously had served as DFO for um, the MRAC and who many of you know very, quite well. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Commissioner Johnson. Okay, um, moving to the next section, I'll begin today's discussion on CCP risk and governance with some initial remarks. And then I'll engage Marnie Rosenberg and Eileen Kiley uh, to participate in some uh, questions and answers. Marnie Rosenberg is a managing director and global head of counterparty credit risk and strategy within JP Morgan's risk management function. Eileen Kiley is a managing director and deputy head of counterparty risk within BlackRock's risk and quantitative analysis team. I'll then ask Suzanne Sprague to kindly provide some remarks on the transition of core CCP services to the cloud. Suzanne Sprague serves as Senior Managing Director and the Global Head of Clearing and Post-Trade Services at CME Group. As with today's section on transition away from LIBOR, a vote will not follow uh, the discussion on CCP risk uh, because the, the CCP Risk and Governance Subcommittee's term was extended before its expiration. So I'll begin with my comments and I'll start actually with my disclaimer. Uh, I'll note that my comments should be associated with the Futures Industry Association as its representative on MRAC and not Goldman Sachs. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, thank you for keeping the CCP Risk Subcommittee alive, as it has been and will continue to be an important forum for the industry to convene and work collectively towards reducing market risk. The Commissioner asked me to briefly recap the subcommittee's work on CCP governance and to touch on the CF CFTC's recent proposal that largely reflects its recommendations. First, I think it's important to note that the subcommittee had several work streams related to CCP risk in addition to governance, including margin, CCP capital, stress testing, and liquidity and transparency. Over many months of discussion and thoughtful input, the committee came to consensus in two main areas, margin and governance. On the others, we laid tremendous groundwork in identifying important issues and considerations. Today, we're focusing on the governance of CCPs, which many members of this committee agree are foundational to all of the issues under consideration by the subcommittee. By governance, we are referring to the process through which a CCP's management and board of directors solicit, consider, and address input from clearing members and end users in decisions that materially affect the risk profile of the CCP. The subcommittee reached agreement on two important recommendations both of which were reflected in the CFTC's recent DCO governance proposal. First, that CCP should be required to establish one or more risk forums to obtain views of a broad array of market participants in material risk decisions. And second, that the CFTC should codify the establishment and practices of risk management committees. On certain topics for which the subcommittee did not reach consensus, the commission's proposal asks for the public to provide feedback including whether CCP should be required to consult market participants prior to submitting material rule changes to the CFTC for approval. The work of the subcommittee in identifying consensus and the CFTC's proposal to adopt its recommendations are an important step forward and demonstrate the important role that MRAC can play. <laughs> to hear from others, I'll turn to Eileen Kiley from BlackRock. Eileen, you may have rather nuanced views on governance requirements as a representative of an end user. In your view, does the CFTC proposal achieve the governance goals for buy-side market participants? Uh, thank you, Alicia, and, and thank you to, to the commissioners for uh, inviting me back to this uh, illustrious group. Uh, so while we are still working through, uh, we are working through all of our, uh, our thoughts still on this proposal as it is, it is um, very, very long, and we will be submitting a comment letter uh, that, uh, that provides a more complete picture of, of, of our views, but Overall, I think the proposal achieves many of the objectives sought by uh, end investors with respect to DCO governance, specifically on representation. Uh, we believe that formally requiring end user representation on risk governance is something that is very consistent with the DCO core principle Q, and that this proposal actually closes a gap by specifically including end investors uh, as required participants. So we are very pleased with that. 
Nevertheless, we do believe that representation is a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, to uh, balanced governance. And I think we would all agree that balanced governance is something that underpins market safety uh, and stability. So for example, when we look to DCO core principle O, uh, which provides additional guardrails uh, for alongside representation, specifically to permit the consideration of views of owners and participants, as well as fulfilling public interest requirements. To that end, we believe that additional consideration should be given to requiring DCOs to actively solicit views from owners and participants. We believe that if our clients are subject to loss allocation from DCOs, which we are largely, then those DCOs should be required to ask us what we think about these, uh, these issues. Uh, and before material risk issues are brought to RMCs, we believe that DCO should be actively working with market participants to understand their views. Now, this may be the role that was envisioned by these risk working groups, uh, but we believe that there, there needs to be a little more specificity in how those are going to work that really does require um, the DCOs to be more proactively reaching out to the market for their views. So thank you for the opportunity to provide those. Great, thank you very much, Eileen. Marnie, I'll turn to you. Um, which topics discussed by the subcommittee would you like to see further work on from a clearing member and participant perspective? Thank you. Um, well, first, thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for accepting me back to the, to the MRAC. I'm really happy to be here and continue to work on these issues and, and, and discussions, be part of the discussions. Um, so JP Morgan was supportive and actively contributed to the efforts of this subcommittee, the CCP Risk and Governance Subcommittee, um, over the course of the two years, 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, as Alicia already noted, we, we focused on um, several different areas um, related to the resilience of the clearing system. Um, just to mention again, CCP Risk Governance, so risk committees, for example, um, CCP Margin, um, and CCP transparency, CCP capital and skin in the game, and stress testing and liquidity. Um, overall, we were supportive of the recommendations in the subcommittee's paper on CCP governance, which was presented to the MRAC in February of last year. Um, and as a result, we were also very encouraged to see the CFTC propose two rule changes on CCP governance consistent with recommendations from the subcommittee, namely the codification of best practice on risk management committees and the establishment of risk working groups. We also welcome the opportunity to comment on two potential CCP governance uh, changes which were not subject to consensus within the subcommittee, but which, which we feel are really important to, to progress, including requiring CCPs to formally consult with market participants prior to fi filing any material rule changes with the CFTC and allowing risk committee members to consult with experts at their employer. We commend the commission on issuing uh, this proposal and look forward to commenting, which, which we will be doing so. Um, beyond governance, we are also su supported the committee's, subcommittee's recommendations on margin that was also issued in February of 2021, um, which are intended to ensure that margin models are robust. Market development since that time, including the significant volatility in energy, agriculture, and rates, have further emphasized the need for a broad range of measures to address margin procyclicality and ensuring that there are sufficient levels of margin, particularly in exchange trade derivative products. Um, and we've been, um, we've been vocal on that in the past as well, um, as well as improved disclosures on margin so that participants can really um, understand and predict potential um, uh, liquidity demands. We welcome continued focus on this topic through BCBS, CPMI, OSCO, and would encourage uh, timely regulatory action um, on this topic. And as I highlighted at the July 2021 meeting, the last time that MRAC met, the lack of consensus between subcommittee members on the important topics considered by the subcommittee, such as CCP capital and transparency, highlights the need for regulatory action on these outstanding matters. Um, we'd welcome further discussion on these topics in particular. Um, so finally, we commend Commissioner Johnson for putting this important topic on the agenda for today's meeting. We appreciate it, um, first under her sponsorship and look forward to continuing to work collaborat collaboratively with all of you 
other MREC members to advance the common goal of making markets more efficient um, and resilient. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Marnie and Eileen. At this point, I'll open up the floor to questions and comments from other MRAC members. Okay, seeing none, I'll turn to our virtual participants. And then to our commissioners. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect time. <laughs> While there may not be comments immediately, thank you so much, Commissioner Goldsmith Romero, for joining us today. Um, we are really appreciative of the time she um, took to sit with us. It really is a commitment and an investment. I have a pretty good idea of some of the other demands on her plate, so that was beyond generous of her to, to be present with us for so much of the discussion today. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you very much. Um, now I'll turn to Suzanne Sprague from CME Group to kindly provide some remarks about transitioning CCP services to the cloud. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me for here today and for the opportunity to serve on this committee. Cloud computing has grown exponentially in recent years and it can help businesses scale applications and services more efficiently and quickly while also providing best in class security and resiliency. For market participants, that means the ability to leverage open source software, minimize operational overhead and create a more efficient trading and clearing experience. As financial markets have seen message traffic increase significantly over the years, the need for scale becomes even more important to make sure all of our clients can better analyze and mitigate risk across asset classes. The cloud allows us to scale with market demand in a way that requires excess capacity only when we need it. CME and Google Cloud have formed a 10-year strategic partnership under which CME will migrate its technology infrastructure to the cloud in a phased approach beginning with data and post-trade services. Later phases will focus on moving markets to the cloud. The next generation of financial markets will depend on the ability of market participants to have the most efficient access possible to manage their risks via transparent and fair markets in real time. The best way to ensure that happens is to migrate our technology to the cloud. Through our partnership with Google, CME will be able to scale our infrastructure to provide market participants with enhanced risk management tools, provide increased access for more market participants, optimizing costs and helping onboard new users more quickly, and streamline operations, optimize IT infrastructure, and further automate non-trading operations. We're in the early stages of this migration, and we look forward to what's to come. As we proceed, we plan to work closely with regulators, clients, and the industry on the migration. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Suzanne. At this time, I'll open up to the floor for questions and comments from our AMRAC members. I'll make, I'll make a comment. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I'm completely in support of cloud, cloud approach to clearing. One thing we've seen in terms of co-location and the cost of that is really comes down once you've got it centered in the cloud. Folks can go to the same data center and rent for a, a really low cost space um, that's much different than the way we see co-location done today. So I think that's an important point um, to keep in mind about market access, the quality of market access. Great. Thank you. Todd? Thank you. Uh, yes. Another question about migrating to the cloud. Uh, does the CFTC have... Uh, the same regulatory oversight of cloud service providers that they do of um, trading platforms and central counterparties? Or is that something that um, migrating to the cloud will inhibit the CFTC's oversight of these participants? So I'm happy for you, Suzanne, to share some, some reflections here. Uh, my law professorial experience is prompting me to want to call on people. We describe it as cold calling and the Socratic method, but I'm going to resist that and just telepathically signal to maybe a couple of you in the room that might have reflections on this, that you are welcome to share them. Um, but I'll, I'll let Suzanne respond. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Commissioner Johnson. So our interactions with the CFTC about the cloud service providers would be consistent with that of other third-party service providers. Um, 
that do have an impact to specifically clearing systems and migration of clearing systems to the cloud. So the governance process for us is the same for something like a cloud provider as it would be for any other vendors that provide um, systemically important uh, services or are used in systemically important services that the clearing houses provide the industry. Same goes for our board governance process too. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm hopping in again, Chair, only because I'm trying not to look to the side of the room where Biz's card is up because there were other eyes I wanted to catch as well. But Biz, I'm so glad you volunteered. I'll get out of your way, Alicia. <laughs> Biz, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I, I think it's a you know it's it's part of the evolution of markets and infrastructure that you know we are looking at cloud as something obviously in our social interactions we are completely on. Most of us don't even realize it. And the transition to the cloud for us in our day-to-day -day has changed. But obviously, when it comes to clearing, obviously very systematically important reporting. Um, the, the question I have is the whole industry participants, um, either clearing participants or their clients, are themselves probably in various stages of migration to the cloud. And um, so the transition process is almost like changing the wheels of a car that's on a racetrack. Like, how do you do that without bringing it to a halt? How, uh, and I think that's probably going to be a very important part for the subcommittee to consider, is how do we manage the transition because the various participants of the industry that are currently clearing are in different, probably, not only stages of cloud adoption, but are probably looking at different cloud vendors. So the compatibility or maybe having the system exist you know, on bilateral or parallel rails where some participants continue to use the old services and some migrate to cloud. Just maybe a practical consideration we have to look into it. And so, you know, whether that's, you know, being done through a clearing provider, um, obviously, uh, I think the industry associations probably uh, need to weigh on it as well. Because uh, members obviously are in very different technology, you know, shapes and sizes. So. I, I think that would be a very practical aspect for the subcommittee to think about the transition. Thank you, Biz. Are you wait? Are you raising your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments from the members present in the room? We'll turn to members participating virtually. Any questions or comments? I'll check with you, Commissioner Johnson. Very good. Okay. Oh, sorry. Super quick. Um, I think that there are benefits to going to the cloud. There are some cloud uh, service providers that are also significant market participants. So, for example, with Google, uh, over at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they are a power marketer because the financing model of a lot of large-scale renewable generation um, involves uh, companies like Google to be an active participant in these markets, and they've been authorized to have market-based rate authority and are trading uh, electricity in uh, the the physical spot markets, and so I'm sure that there are sort there are different confidentiality uh, agreements, but it would just be important for the CFTC to understand some of those because in some cases, uh, especially if we're looking at hosting, you know, transactional uh, market operations by an entity that is also simultaneously a market participant there might be potential conflicts there that, uh, uh, again, may not be an issue, but just should be something to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Tyson. Okay, one last check. All right, we will head and transition to our fifth and final section of the day, beginning with an introductory discussion of market structure issues. This discussion will be facilitated by Biz Chatterjee with assistance from Eileen Kiley, Suzanne Sprague, and Ryan Miller. Biz Chatterjee is a managing director and the head of innovation for Citigroup's Global Markets Division. He serves as the president and CEO of the firm's broker-dealer entity, Citigroup Global Markets. 
Ryan Miller is the general counsel of FTX US. Further discussion followed by a vote to reestablish the market structure subcommittee will follow the introductory discussion. And I'll now ask Biz to kindly kick us off. Thank you, Alicia. Um, you know, given that, as my colleague I mentioned, we're standing between everyone and lunch and, you know, flight and train schedules, we'll uh, try to be brief and get to the point. Um, as uh, markets continue to evolve and change um, with changing economic conditions, with the entry and exit of new participants and with participants evolving needs, uh, and sometimes, you know, based on external factors like regulatory capital regime changes, legislation, the, the market continues to innovate and evolve. Uh, new products are launched, uh, new ways of exchanging risks uh, come into the marketplace. Uh, Taking into consideration all these changes that continue to evolve and, and probably get to a critical scale, um, we were trying uh, within our group to figure out what is the objective way to evaluate some of these new proposals uh, that seek to address this evolving change in the marketplace. So following up on the, uh, the uh, full day of hearings the commission had earlier in the year on direct versus indirect or intermediated clearing, uh, we thought we would lead a discussion on trying to put an objective framework to say, is there a better world out there that meets or adapts uh, to this evolving marketplace? Or is it limited to these two choices that were presented and discussed, or is there even a better hybrid system that could live you know, uh, side by side? Or is one system better suited to a certain market structure driven by a new set of participants and products? So happy to uh, start the discussion and then invite my colleagues to uh, share their views. Uh, we wanted to frame the discussion on, on three large pillars, uh, the first being safety and soundness. Uh, we wanted to look at the proposals, uh, current ones on the table, any future ones, on what does it have when it comes to impact and risk protection and layers of protection that exist or should exist in a clearing system. Uh, what is the impact on specific firms, you know, specifically to their guarantee funds or their IM levels? Uh, what is the degree of operational complexity that a CCP and other clearing participants will have to face between the two systems? And is there a better economic, uh, sorry, a better operational complexity uh, trade-off that we can establish against? And finally, I think which is extremely important under the safety and, and soundness principle is the protection of assets, especially of our end user clients that are in the system, whether accessing the system directly or indirectly. That's the second pillar we wanted to look at in, in trying to evaluate um, these proposals are around the quality and level of service uh, that the participants would get or expect to get from the clearing ecosystem. So these are things related to due diligence of, of participants that are in the clearing ecosystem. Uh, AML and KYC is becoming an extremely important issue as the markets become more and more internationally collected. And then some of the other aspects to the day-to-day -day and BAU servicing that every clearing participant, whether they're an end user or a direct participant, gets in terms of reports and statuses and, and things like that. Uh, the final pillar we wanted to look at uh, or establish while evaluating uh, these proposals on market structure is what are the trade-offs when it comes to complying with regulatory frameworks? Uh, will there be an issue on timeliness and quality of reporting? Will there be issues related to transparency of uh, positions and other issues like that? Um, another key issue that always comes up is, is how do we manage conflicts of interest between the various participants that are in the ecosystem, the, the clearing houses, the, the direct participants versus the indirect participants. And finally, an issue which I think the clearing subcommittee has touched on is governance uh, and transparency on who is involved in the decision making process. So uh, with that, let me pause uh, and invite uh, my colleague on the MRAC, Eileen, to uh, start the discussion, followed by Suzanne, and then Ryan uh, will chime in. Great. Thank you, Biz. So when Biz and I had a conversation about this session, uh, it, it, it occurred to me that it might be helpful to step back and think about some just basic principles that we think should govern 
any market structure. And this is certainly from an end investor perspective. For those of you who may not have heard um, me introduce myself before, usually when I introduce myself, I remind everybody that I'm here as a fiduciary on behalf of BlackRock's clients. My view is not representing BlackRock Inc. Um, and with that frame, the, the comments that I'm going to make are really on behalf of, of, our, of our clients. And these apply to any asset class and should really under, underpin the goal of risk-controlled innovation. So five key principles. Number one, customer assets and positions must be protected. We've heard that repeatedly. Number two, incentives in the structure must be sufficiently aligned to protect investors. Three, credit risk in the system must be sufficiently managed. Four, loss given default should be minimized. And then five, transparency and a legal framework must be in place to support one through four. So going into a little bit more detail on all of these, number one on the customer asset protection, we, we want customer assets and positions to be protected from bankruptcy risk through account segregations and supporting bankruptcy legal regimes. Um, but we also want our positions, which are often hedges, to be protected from un, unexpected or unpredictable liquidation. Number two on the incentive structure, we believe that the owners of the infrastructure must be incentivized to minimize customer losses and not be allowed to externalize losses to the market. On the credit risk in the system, in my career, I've been, I've been a fundamental credit analyst, uh, analyst, and so I believe that fundamental analysis in this system is still very important. Um, there's two aspects of credit risk that, that most people will think about. It's the, it's the fundamental analysis and it's the financial support. We don't believe that you can have one without the other. We believe they need to be um, in the system. And there's also needs to be a financial safeguard package to reduce the probability of default in the first place. Um, conservative IM, funded backstop resources, et cetera. And then fourth, the loss given default should be minimized. And that gets at there being a sufficient waterfall in place where clients are the last to be allocated losses. Um, and that should only also be done um, by, if it's deemed appropriate by supervisory authority. And then lastly, the transparency and legal framework, I think, is, is a very easy principle to think about. Uh, you know, transparency on the rationale behind sizing financial safeguard pa packages, methodology and sufficiency of mathematical models used to size the financial safeguard package, track record with respect to defaults, and then ultimately just a regulatory framework that provides the market uh, a, a roadmap to how to navigate things if they don't go as planned. So that is, uh, that is all for today. Yeah, I, I would agree with those fundamentals. Um, so I think a good analogy would be thinking about getting rid of retail banks and having consumers face the Fed directly and retail banks, of course, hold capital and due diligence on customers today to support the risk that they're taking on. And that provides a significant layer of protection in the system for the retail banking industry. And what we're talking about in our industry is not too different in thinking about no longer having intermediaries that perform those functions that Eileen outlined. So it's not to say that the model today is perfect and can't ever change to business points. It is worthwhile considering hybrid models or evolving our historical model as it's existed to date, but they're not really easy problems to solve. If you think about ways that you would recreate those layers of protection that Eileen outlined and the role that each of the players would, would take in providing those kinds of protections, as well as the diligence that's done to ensure there's comfort with those protections being able to withstand times of crisis and stress. And again, in our industry, we largely are talking about institutional um, players, commercial hedgers, uh, systemic risk that's mitigated when markets turn volatile, providing a central location for those hedgers to come to manage their risk in times of stress. And that's fundamental to the role that we perform in this marketplace. And I think that has to be upheld first and foremost. So I, I would agree it's worth discussing for sure. Um, it's not to say that where we are today is perfect by any means, but 
thinking about how we would recreate these layers of protection and financial resources in the model are not really easy problems to solve if you take out intermediation. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I'll share some comments and reactions as well. Um, I, I think I'm roughly aligned with a lot of what's being said. Um, when you talk about market structure, there's, there's two points in time. There's how do we get a user into the ecosystem, and then how are we looking at risk and managing risk once they're inside of the ecosystem? So j just to start with the front end of it, I mean, market access is really important, I think, to everyone in this room. We want to make sure that everyone's able to show up, knows what they're doing, and is able to interact with the market as relevant to their needs. Um, I, I work at a company called FTX. One thing that we're putting in the context of our derivatives exchange is a lot of consumer education and disclosures on the front end. And I think this has been a, a valid question in the context of disintermediation. Who's gonna bring those disclosures to the customers? Who's gonna ensure there's an, an appropriate amount of education, uh, potentially including you know, a quiz or a knowledge-based entrance barrier or, or, or um, guideline before folks start to trade? So I think that's an important responsibility of folks who are looking at a disintermediated model is bringing that education and disclosure to the user community. So that, that's one side of it. On the risk side, I, I think for the 12, 13 years I've been in this industry, we're always talking about CCC waterfalls, CCP waterfalls. Is there enough um, skin in the game? It's not a new observation, not a new comment, but I, I think it's fair to say that we're, we're open to considering options and other models, or at least we should at least think about it. And one model is, um, like the FTX proposal, is putting quite a bit more cash, unencumbered cash, into a default fund, into the, into the waterfall, um, and, and not looking to um, unfunded capital calls from the FCM community as the primary source of backstop in the event of loss. And so that, that's an idea, I think, that you know, historically the idea of skin in the game has been talked about as a potential deficiency in the current model. I don't think we're saying that it's broken. What we're saying is let's consider a different model and see if there's an appetite for that choice in the market. And, and one way to do that is to, to open up different choice models and let user communities decide where they end up wanting to trade. Um, one, one aspect that makes um, a disintermediated model a you know, potentially better choice for certain aspects of the market is they get to control their exposure on their position um, if you're requiring the margin to be funded. Um, in our model, the margin that's at the exchange is all that is considered um, to support the position. If the position goes in a particular direction, we look only to the margin that's been put at, at the clearinghouse. And I think for some users, that's a trading model that might be interesting. And we've certainly seen a demand for it globally. And I think in the US, for a, for a market structure subcommittee, um, it's a great topic to, to have on the table. Great. Thank you very much for those comments. To further discuss market structure risks and vote on reestablishing the market structure subcommittee, which is currently inactive, is there a motion from the body to recommend to the commission that it reestablish the market structure subcommittee? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. It has been moved and properly seconded that the MRAC reestablish the market structure subcommittee. Prior to taking a vote on reestablishing the market structure subcommittee, I would like to open the floor to questions and comments from the MRAC members. Neil, we'll start with you. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll and thank you for recognizing me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate some of the comments that I made as a representative of Fidelity at the um, the roundtable that was held a couple of months ago on this topic, um, specifically around like we weren't supposed to call it the FTX proposal, but that, that's what it was called. <laughs> that's what it is. Um, and and it, I, it, I think it was. I'm going to echo what some of my colleagues already said here this morning, but I think it's worth uh, saying it again. And that was, you know, this debate about one model versus another model. Right, the, the, the existing intermediated FCM model, um, and then the the at least as it's been put in, in front of this in front of the CFTC, the FTX proposal, which uh, removes the need um, for the FCM type intermediation, um, and I, and I think of those as those those two poles is 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 being useful ways to frame the conversation. But um, but on the one hand, you know we've got a the, the existing model which has been around and has evolved certainly for decades, um, uh, and, and you got a new model which in, in some ways suggests that you can, um, you know, technology and capital are, in part, are at least partially fungible, 
right? And, and to, to, so what extent can you remove some of the capital from the system, replace it with technology or at least a new system, um, and, and still have a safe, uh, well-functioning market in, t in the times that really matter, right? In the really big crises, whether it's in 1987 or 98 or 2008. That, that, that's really what we're talking about and we need well-functioning markets for. Um, and, and, I, and I think that I don't want, I, I think that it seems implausible, at least it seems implausible to me uh, that it, it, you, it, the system's 100% overcapitalized, right? Replacing it all with a new system seems un unlikely. And, and not least, what someone else mentioned now, some market participants may want to continue to use the intermediate model. That might be the best system for them, while the other market participants, potentially new market participants, want access in this more direct way. And I, I think that the, the, the poll, presenting those polls kind of leaves, uh, I guess, begs the question, should we consider some kind of spectrum? Right, and that that opens the gate the gateway for uh, other entities that are that are regulated, just not in the same way perhaps as FCMs or or the or the, or the existing clearinghouses, um, uh, but regulated entities nonetheless to provide that market access uh, via some modification of the proposal that's been put on the table, and I, and I think that that's the type of thing that I, I would be most fruitful for this type of subcommittee to explore, um, as opposed to trying to make some kind of binary decision, we're gonna stick with the way it's always been done, or we're gonna go with a completely new proposal, which I don't really think was on the table, but a lot of the conversation seems to be framing it that way, and um, so I, again, I think that's the way the conversation, I, I, we would love to participate in that conversation, so thank you. Thanks, Neil. Any other comments from members in the room? Okay, we'll move to members participating virtually. Commissioner Johnson, any comments or questions? Okay, uh, with, so in the light of no further discussion, we'll take a vote on the motion to reestablish the market structure subcommittee. Um, similar to some of the other votes we took, a simple majority vote of the present MRAC members is necessary for the motion to pass. So all those in favor of reestablishing the market structure subcommittee say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? For colleagues joining virtually, are there any members opposed? And any abstentions? Okay, the ayes have it, the motion is passed. We'll submit the necessary paperwork to the commission to reestablish the market structure subcommittee, and we'll be seeking MRAC and non-MRAC members to serve on the committee. Before I hand it over to Commissioner Johnson, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone uh, for going quite easy on me as my first meeting as chair. Um, but really, in terms of the engagement, the level of participation, the constructive discussion, I think this has been really helpful. Uh, we look forward to your participation, uh, not only at the parent committee level, but also in the various subcommittees. To that extent, if you have an interest in participating in a subcommittee, uh, please let us know. Uh, I think reaching out to Bruce or Marilee will be helpful, um, and we'll be taking all that on board. But thank you very much, and Commissioner Johnson, over to you. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, first, I, in an ideal world, we'd give you a round of applause, if not a standing ovation. Uh, you did an exceptional job, and it's no surprise at all. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset of our meeting today, Alicia holds leadership roles, significant leadership roles in the futures in OTC clear, prime and clearing businesses at Goldman Sachs. Um, she also serves on FIA's board and OCC's board, and this is no surprise to anybody who has been in the room for the entire day. She's a captain who can very much steer the ship. And so I feel very um, grateful. Again, I have to just use that word because it isn't sufficiently large enough to capture how thankful I am that she shares in her time and talents with us. It is of significant service to the CFTC, but even more so to the American people and to establishing um, a resilient, to establishing resilient markets and ensuring the integrity of our, our markets and economy. So um, each of you, I, I would extend that grace and thanks to because your time is tremendously valuable. You are among the most senior um, folks in the businesses that you operate. Um, you are among the most sought after experts and academics um, and voices in public interest. And so we are quite fortunate that you would give your time, talent, and energy to us today. Um, before I close really quickly, I just want to say a couple of things and then another couple of words of thanks. One of the things I'd share is that um, as someone who's deeply intellectually interested, but also been a practitioner as a lawyer and a business person in financial markets, um, there is an event in the history of our nation that is really striking to me, uh, and that's the launch of the PCORA hearings in the Senate Banking Committee um, in the years following the stock market crash of 1929. During that hearing, uh, Congress heard from a number of market participants, 
heard from voices in academia, heard from voices in public interest about exactly how the absence of uniform laws and regulation governing securities distributions in public markets could deeply harm individual investors, our communities, and our nation's economy. Following those hearings led by Ferdinand Pecora, um, Congress adopted the Securities Act of 1933. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in 1922, Congress had adopted the Future Grains Act, which ultimately came to be the statute that creates the remit for the CFTC. I mention these two historic moments because, in my humble opinion, there are times in the history of our nation and the history of the world where very important and talented people come together and lend a hand to create and establish the framework that can be used to facilitate the functioning, development, and innovation in markets I feel greatly privileged to have the opportunity to serve in this role as a commissioner and tremendously privileged to serve as sponsor of the MRAC with all of you gathered at my side. I am excited for the things that we'll accomplish and for the ways that we will influence important questions that the White House, Congress, regulators overseas around the world are already deeply thoughtful about. So thank you again for your time and coming. Thank you for your thoughtfulness and service in advance on subcommittees. And I have to pause and say thanks to my team, uh, my council who have served um, tirelessly to bring this event together, to our ADFO, Marilee Dallum, who is also just um, peerless, is how I would describe her at this point, in terms of her indefatigable efforts to um, ensure the success of this meeting. I also want to thank IT and everyone who's working behind the scenes, uh, not in this room, but in parallel, actually physically in parallel to this room, um, to ensure that those who've joined us virtually and those of you um, who are part of the public audience were able to participate at least in terms of reception of the conversation here and hopefully uh, in due course in additional ways as well. Uh, with that, I'll pause and um, sort of hand, uh, the, pass the microphone, if you will, uh, back to Bruce Fekra, who is my chief counsel, and Marilee Dahl. Dahlman, sorry, Marilee. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Alicia Crichton. Our Thank you to all the members who, who joined us today and to our speakers, Peter Zaman from Singapore and uh, Ryan Miller from New York City. So <laughs> thank you very much uh, for attending our first MRAC meeting of 2022. This meeting is now adjourned.